Hey! Oop. I'm get. Wait, hold on. Oh no. Uh, what is wrong? What did I screw up? I'm gonna. Okay. I'm actually gonna go back because I need to fix my mic. So, uh, Jay, I'm actually gonna let you go first while I fix my mic. Hello, hello, yes, I think I might have fixed my mic issues. Um, welcome to everyone both on Jow Camps and my channel. I am peeking here with my mic. Um, yes, um, we are, as as previously stated over on uh, Jow Camps' uh, site, is that uh, we are picking our favorite uh we're going through our favorites we are specifically picking yeah the uh youtube streamers and uh video games and also we are joined by uh but to say if you want to did you introduce uh our other our other friend here ah <laughs> yeah and going back to what you were saying Jao, about feeling like the obvious choice it's always so funny uh every choice everything that i feel like you like we like as people always feels like the obvious choice because it's the obvious choice to us and you always kind of forget that maybe not everyone else is like totally you know watches our things we like listens to our own music but it just kind of feels like oh yeah i feel like i'm not picking anything cool or hip enough but your stuff is cool and hip to somebody else 
<laughs> I say that because I also feel like all my picks are like super basic -y picks. So maybe I'm just like, this is my bit of cope before we get started. Yes. <laughs> That's kind of what I picked. I, you know, I always find it more fun picking the stuff that means the most to you over what you think is the best. I was actually weirdly having a conversation about this with uh, some friends at work the other day when we were talking about the Beatles albums. And someone asked me, he was like, oh, what do you think is the best one? And it's like, well, my favorite is the White Album. It's not at all the one I think is the best. I actually think there's definitely lots of better ones. But to me, it's the one that was most important to me growing up. It's the one that kind of clicks to me. It's the one that my specific brain kind of enjoys the most. So, yeah, that's kind of that's what I went with. <laughs> I think that's how, yeah, you laid it out. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, I um uh yeah, I, I feel like looking at your stuff, there's a couple things that I am very much not surprised at. I am very much not surprised at the uh Eternal Darkness and Bloodborne. Um <laughs> I think I don't let you I'll let you break this down however you want to go through these, but the thing I would say that actually surprises me the most out of all the stuff that I'm seeing here is Virtua Fighter. Thank you. 
Hmm. like almost dragging his layer like so It is really one of those things, I think, in its time, not even in its time, like, because I've, I've, you know, I've dipped in and I've played some of these games, like, years and years later, and I don't know, some of them still kind of have their magic, like, that yeah. Super Nintendo era, which once we get to my picks, you'll see that a lot of it comes from that era, um, yeah, it's just, I don't know, I just, I just really appreciate uh, what they were able to do with, <laughs> with like, you know, those kind of old now 30 year old games. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the ages being recreated in so many times. Um, but even, yeah, like Jay made a good point. It's like when, when it was um, released and following that, you had um, Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages kind of follow a similar format. Um, yeah. Those, I think, continued the world building a bit, right? A lot, actually, right? Um, and so I think uh, it was kind of one of those early experiments of like when you format a game into like a new lens, I guess, like either just more stylized 2D, more bits. Um, or 2D to 3D, like some of the other examples we'll probably explore, um, you know, that that becomes the, the new standard, you know, in a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it really did influence every Legend of Zelda game moving forward, even up until kind of the... Um, well, and I, mean, I, would, I would say it even influenced Orcarina of Time, right, with the dual world kind of thing. But there were games for the DS that were coming out that were still in that art style and still in that, they still had that vibe of A Link to the Past all the way up until like 2013, 2014. Um, and, and I just saw in my chat also, Tauth, you're like, yeah, it was a massive shift. And I think that speaks to what you were just talking about there as well, Jules. Like it, it, it built the legacy from which all of the rest of the Legend of Zelda's legacy was built off of artistically. Um, it's also kind of any... funny that we are at a like we're still at a point where a lot of kids' first game still is Legend of Zelda. It might be <laughs> Wind Waker, it might be you know Breath of the Wild. It, but I I kind of love that I don't know this still around and they're still making Zelda games and yeah I don't know I I just love that that's still a part of video gaming experience is a new Zelda game coming out. 
Yeah, let's not spoil it, but I'm very curious if any of you all have a Legend of Zelda game on your list, too. <laughs> well, I, I didn't... Okay, I don't know if we want to spoil each other's stuff. I will let's say right now... Let's not spoil it. No, okay, okay, never mind. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> well, I was... Go. Yeah, I was very curious if we would have overlap, and it's all... I don't know, that's all I'll say. Okay, okay, sounds good. Uh, Jill's last thoughts before we move on to my next game. Or any final thoughts, anyone? No, I don't think so. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Yeah, so Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past. When I put that on there, I was like, this feels like such a safe short. This feels like such a, such a safe choice. But it's also like the choice. Because when I daydream about taking time off and just playing a video game all night, it's this game, you know, it's it. And these are not in order, but it's definitely that game. Um, so next resident evil. Um, I was in college when resident, when I was able to finally buy a PlayStation and play resident evil. And it was the first time that something truly scared me. You know, I think there's something so immersive about the tank controls, the pre-rendered graphics, the, the cheesy, like, um, these are the actors who moved to Japan and are American passing. So let's use them to make the intro to our video game. Oh yeah. Like, what is the famous that... line what is like that? the famous line in that game is like, you were almost a Jill sandwich. Jill sandwich. After... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are so many cheesy lines. Like it captured a combination of cheesy horror film, but while still maintaining an ability to be scary because I think it was, it was really the first time that a horror game, um, like through its controls, through the, through the, the survival mechanics that were kind of developed in sweet home and then brought over to resident evil. Like it was the first time all of these things had been blended together in a way that you were panicking about your resources and your, and your herbs. You were, you were really like waiting for that next safe room. Uh, spoiler, alert, spoiler alert, but there's a scene where a dog jumps through a window and regardless of how many times I play it, I still get jump scared, you know? Oh, so, I, I, know what, I know what you're talking about. And yep. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah, right at the beginning. So the original Resident Evil for me is, and you know, I'm, I'm realizing it's one of the ones I have to get the, I have to get the original Resident Evil series for my PlayStation so we can play those on chat. Um, uh, sorry, on stream. But it uh, it's hard to say how to express just how influential this game is. I actually think I'm still a gamer because of Resident Evil. And I would say in parallel to that Silent Hill, the original Silent Hill. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of showed me that storytelling and immersion had had taken a new, had gone to an, another level, uh, even beyond the Legend of Zelda: Link to the Past. And as we're as we're talking about this, I, I'm really realizing how many leaps in a medium I have experienced. Right, because like I could go back and watch Citizen Kane, and I can see the leap from from a talkie to like a silent film to to Citizen Kane. Right, like that's yeah. a huge leap. But I can't see as big of a leap from like Citizen Kane to, let's say, um, Memento or something, right? Like any other movie. Um, the the medium kind of found its voice and it, it evolved. Don't get me wrong. Like amazing things are still happening in film. But it kind of stayed the course for a long time. And I think gaming is one of these things where I've actually been able to experience the growth and the change and how the stories are told and how people use it as a, as a medium. Well, one thing I wanted to jump in and say with resident evil is I, I there, I know. Okay. So there were horror games before PlayStation, before resident evil, before silent Hill. But like, I'm trying to think of like, there was a Friday the 13th, like 2d game. So Yeah. But it's funny thinking like I it's hard for me to imagine someone truly being scared in that era the way Resident mm. Evil and Silent Hill scared people. And I could be totally yeah. corrected uh, 
if someone know if someone's more knows more of history than I do, but there is something about that jump to 3D, that jump to feeling like you're a body in a very specific 3D space that really is a huge leap in feeling scared and feeling terrified because I don't know. Now it's not cartoony, even though now, you know, looking yeah. back at Resident Evil, of course it looks can't be an old, but like you just that feeling of like, I am a, a helpless body in space really like you can feel it once it jumped to 3d. Yeah, I would agree with that. I feel like, you know, we even have like a new precedent starter again, as one of your favorites today. And, you know, you mentioned, yeah, like storytelling, the weight matters, the weight is carried through and translated through the experience. But I think because the, you know, any game is built on the rules of say surviving, losing, or, you know, having to reset the level or reset the session. Um, you know, when you basically don't perform the task that's given to you. Um, and I feel like that's the thing is that these were new rules, a new format, and those new mm -hmm. roles were a part of that format that made it difficult to maybe, um, you know, navigate this environment in a new perspective, like the camera was different. Um, <laughs> and so I'm wondering if that contributed to, because of the new format and difficulty, like, and then the horror aesthetic and the theme kind of carried together that, that thrill, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. And you bring up some, I think that's a great point. Like the, uh, the camera angle and the controls worked together to almost make you feel constrained. Yeah. You know, like they, they weren't perfect fluid controls. And I think in a way that like that did what you're talking about, it like created a sense of immersion and fear because it wasn't like you could just like, even with an old, an old, um, even with a lot of, uh, NES games, like the fluidity of the controls was such that, um, you had a lot of, you had a lot of control. You had a lot of fluidity, and you did not have that in Resident Evil. And it, that like, one of you. yeah, yeah. And I think one of the 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 things I love about this era of introducing horror games is the idea of that helpless feeling, that feeling of mm -hmm. my character is very weak and there are a lot of things more powerful here. And that's different from, say, you know, classic Mega Man games where it's like, oh, yeah, like technically I'm very weak and this game's very challenging. But, you know, it's it, 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 at no point in like these sort of horror era horror games can you bring that early Mega Man thing of just like, oh, if I just get really good, if I just like become right. a really skilled character, I'll dominate this. No matter what, Why you kind of have this feeling of like, even at my best, I'm still kind of helpless. Yeah, which I think we're going to talk a little bit about when we get to Bloodborne, because Bloodborne is the opposite, right? It's like the insurmountable odds are there, but if you can get good enough, you can overcome them. So yeah. it, it's like two different types of difficulty. Um, okay, I don't want to take up too much of our time, so I'll move on to Castlevania next. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Jill's just commented there that like, yeah, the jank being the main game mechanic. <laughs> Any, do you want to add anything to that? Because I think that is a brilliant thing you pointed out, which it's like, yeah, it creates, it creates the difficulty in some ways. Yeah, I got one of my game favorites as an example for this, so we'll come back. Oh, okay. Awesome. I know. There's so many things um, on my list that I'm like, oh, I want to bring it up now, but I also want to wait. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, well, you know, we got a we got a two to three hour stream ahead of us, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it in the tank. That's true. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next up, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. This was, uh, for me, a... This is going to sound so cheesy, but it was like a revelation, right? It was like the Beatles' White Album, right? It was it was seeing a series that you loved as a kid suddenly come out going like, yeah, we made those first three records. Like we made those first three games to get good enough to make this game. And I think as we were talking about this, a thing, something just clicked in my mind. I know you all noticed it earlier, but 
I think we have the two definitive games that have led to the creation of the Metroidvania genre. Mm -hmm. And even though I love games like Hollow Knight and several others, when I really want to play a Metroidvania, you know, it's like that Castlevania, the original Castlevania Symphony of the Night to me is the one that I, I'm drawn to. I love, I'm, I'm, pre, I'm sure it's pretty obvious from the four corner there on the right that I love that, um, uh, I love that um, kind of a uh, gothic eldritch horror aesthetic. And all of these kind of combine in that way, I think. Um, I was going to yeah, comment that a lot of these I... have a very grim aesthetic to them that of all of your well I, yeah i'd say the happiest one of the games that you have is probably zelda and virtua fighter <laughs> are like <laughs> the only thing close to kind of like not dark <laughs> yeah dark but just matched with quality you know and i think yeah. that's part of the awe is um even even with some of the the others on this list it's like that's what carries this and kind of makes it um approachable yeah um i, I want to bring up something that uh our chat chat brought up which is that um let me just see if i can read this here uh oh this is probably something we'll talk about a little bit more on yours jules but um games like qwop and girp i don't know how to say that one garp <laughs> really leaned into um and then they asked do you watch erenth signal you know who that is? Errant Signal? Sorry, my, my chat box is a little small on my screen, everyone. I, I need to get a second screen. Sorry about that. Um, I also don't know what Errant Signal is. So, yeah, maybe... Oh, okay. uh, I yeah. think I've heard of Errant Signal, but I haven't watched it too much. But I see that Jules can see my chat, so I'll uh, I'll just get back to talking about Castlevania Symphony Night. For me, the, the graphics on this game still hold up. When I daydream about making a video game... Castlevania Symphony of the Night is the way the game would look. And then I think the the other big thing with Castlevania Symphony of the Night, for me anyway, was the soundtrack. Because oh, yeah. Because we'd really just moved into the CD era, and we'd really just started getting these like lush, vibrant, really amazing um, soundtracks. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have too much else to say about it because it's it's so definitive, you know, <laughs> in its in its you in its like creative prowess and its evolution of the Castlevania kind of story and the evolution of the Castlevania lineage. That um, now if remind you have me, not played Castlevania Symphony Night, go play it. <laughs> yeah, remind me again. Is this the first 3D Castlevania? No, no. No, no. Okay. Castlevania not no, definitely not. The first 3D Castlevania if I'm remembering correctly was for the Nintendo 64 and it was it was a complete debacle and I don't think they got oh, 3D right yeah. until we until PlayStation 2 era when they had um oh, I'm forgetting the name of it. Um the PlayStation 2 one was actually pretty good and it told the origin story of the Belmont family and the Belmont whip. Uh yes, but, yes, um, yes. I'm forgetting the name of it, yeah. Um So no, it's 2D, um beautiful, absolutely beautiful 2D art, took it to the next level, um beautifully rendered backgrounds, just fantastic music. It's and then the the fact that the game has a twist at the end that like expands the game quite a bit it's it's a completionist daydream like a uh, dream you know it's an it's an amazing game but yeah anything to add have either of you i guess have either of you played this game i have not no i have not played the symphony of night oh we're gonna have to fix this <laughs> i don't think i've actually finished a castlevania game I've I've certainly played a fair amount of them, but I don't think I've ever gotten to the end of them. Um, mm. I'm I'm and I know there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you do you know if you've ever played this one? I don't know if I have. Actually, no, I don't think I don't think mm. I have because I think the ones that I played, I think I played the ones that came before the classic like uh, Super Nintendo. 
Yeah, we may we may have to do a stream where I just hook up the PlayStation and we play some of these games, <laughs> and you all just hang out and play, <laughs> like watch along. Hey, like, I'm I'm you know. down. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's go on to the one that surprised everyone: uh, Virtual Fighter Two. Um, yeah, it it is a departure color wise, uh, theme wise. Um, you know, I I still remember going into a Chuck E. Cheese and playing Virtual Fighter for the first time, the original Virtual Fighter, and it blew my mind. It was the first time seeing those kind of three D graphics. The characters were really fluid. I remember being frustrated because there were no special like no special moves like in Mortal Kombat or in Street Fighter. There are special mm. moves, but you know it's it's a very different philosophy of fighting game. But um, then I got a Sega Saturn gifted to me from a friend, and it came with Virtual Fighter and then Virtual Fighter Two, and I immediately just fell in love with Virtual Fighter Two. It. If, if I ever do a fundraising stream for something for myself, it'll be for a Sega Saturn. Because I oh, have yeah. one and I gifted it away. <laughs> I, I regret that. I love the Sega Saturn. Uh, there are some pivotal games on there that I'd like to play again. Um, but um, yeah, Virtual Fighter 2, just the characters, the graphics, the, the feel of the game. There's just something about it that is so uniquely itself and it's magical it's like for anyone out there who's watching who played daytona usa the game starts and you hear this like funky you know city pop japanese city pop and it's a guy yelling daytona and when you hear it you know what you're in for virtual yeah. fighter feels the same to me it's like i know what it is it is so uniquely itself and it is so it's so distinct, you know. Uh, and yes, Daytona. I'm not going to sing it, but <laughs> anyone who knows, knows. <laughs> I will jump in to uh, say, just looking online right now, looks like you mm -hmm. can get a refurbished Sega Saturn for about 300 bucks. Yeah, which is wild. A lot cheaper um, than I expected. Oh, I, I would have... I mean... I remember them being sixty bucks, so three hundred is pretty pricey. <laughs> oh yeah, but I mean for a system that's like not been around for a long, uh, for a long time. Yeah. There's one in box unopened, maybe unopened. No, unopened. That's going for twelve hundred dollars, but looks yeah. like all the refurbished ones are about two, three hundred bucks. One of these days, and and you know, truth be told, I'd probably mod it so that uh, it would have like the. Uh, the reader inside of it just be i'd buy the physical games you know but um just for the sake of preserving the medium but yeah i love 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 the sega saturn um the big ones for me on that yeah virtual fighter 2 is just fantastic have either of you played a virtual fighter game mm -hmm. and i think as what you were saying it is a less i don't know how to put it like it's it, it was felt more like this is like real fighting, not quite in the Street Fighter 2 way of it's a man with stretchy arms fighting uh, an electric green Brazilian man. It, this Virtua right. Fighter felt like it was trying to be the more like real fighting game. Yeah, it was rooted in reality. Yeah, and I, I, again, I feel like it's one of those, I keep coming back to this, but with rotational 3d rotational like fighting games street fighter style right you've got one opponent on the other side um you've got your health bar right you trying to knock them out um but i think uh, there's like the street fighter like 2d purists you know and then i feel like you've got people who like fighting games that are brand that branch out of that into the 3d realm like soul caliber and tekken mm -hmm. and of course virtual fighter right which yeah was the inspiration for many of those popular 3d based fighting games which have now become entirely their own thing of course right yeah and i still play virtual fighter like every couple of months i've got it on the ps4 oh sweet uh, virtual fighter to virtual fighter 2 virtual fighter 2 and i and i i still love it and then i see in my chat there's a shout out to uh sagata shanshiro i don't know if that's how exactly how you pronounce it but Let's just real quickly. I think there's there's maybe a whole stream that I could do about how odd Sega's advertising is, 
and this was a character that was out of this world that was used to promote the Sega Saturn, and it was like just this martial artist jumping around yelling the most wild and weirdest things while flying across weird landscapes. Um, so go look up the advertisements for Sega Saturn. You will not be disappointed. The video advertisements. I think they're on YouTube, and there are definitely some, some out there that have like the magazines and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I remember the Sega advertisements in the 90s and, and aughts being fairly unhinged because it was that yeah. era where they were trying to be the like, they're trying to be like the cool guy, not your dad stuffing Nintendo. We're like the radical yeah. like Gen X like s- systems. And uh, yeah, th- I remember looking back at some of those and them just being bonkers. Those commercials. Yeah. Yeah, they were very like, um, yo, what's up, what's up, everybody? You don't have the 16-bit mega system? What's going on? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yes, the attitude that Sonic the Hedgehog still has to this very day. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what it was. All right, well, unless anyone has anything else to add. and uh, Yeah, and you know what? I will say, Jules, it is true. Like, I feel like a lot of these are the grandfather games that... that Maybe for nostalgic reasons, I keep going back to um, the game that the game that came closest to me for virtual uh, in in terms of like enjoying it as much as I enjoyed Virtual Fighter Two was probably Dead or Alive when it came to the Xbox because mm. it was just so smooth and so like the the fighting was so great and the multi tiered like stages in terms of like being able to knock characters off of a side of a building etc. But yeah, it just sticks with me that that this was my first 3D fighting game, and it's the 3D fighting game that I still like, still resonates with me. In Dead um, or Alive, I I it's my very early thing of I have a love hate relationship with unlockables and collectibles inside games where I feel like I have to mm-hmm. unlock everything, and so I remember spending hours and hours playing Dead or Alive, trying to unlock all of the fighting costumes. And for for I did game, I know it well as well. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, um, same thing. Jules, anything you want to add, and we'll we'll move on to the next. If not, uh, I'll say two words: Killer Instinct. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> ooh, man, Ultra I forgot combo. about that character design for days. Yeah. Oh god. Yeah, yeah. I love Killer. I mean, Killer Instinct, though. I would I would still qualify that as a two D game, even though it was it was like. It was silicon graphic, 3D rendered yeah. uh, game, but yeah. I'm curious to see if that's on your list, that Jules, but now I'm like, I really want to play it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another one where it was mind-blowing of like, you could punch someone from one level into the other level and mm. blew my brains out. That was so mind-blowing back in the day. Jules, did you play Killer Instinct in the arcade? When was your first? Yeah. When was your yeah, first experience with it in the arcade? There was a, a bowling alley in um, one of those towns outside of the main town I lived in. But yeah, we would play at this bowling alley, uh, arcade. Awesome. Yes. Nostalgia. One of the things I I love about Killer Instinct, and I can't remember if we when we get to the YouTubers, one of my favorite, sometimes even more than playing the game, is to watch the making of a game. And there's a fantastic making of Killer Instinct documentary out there. And um, one of the things they talked about in the documentary was that they had the speakers on the cabinet like designed to handle more volume than normal. So that when someone got one of those combos, like an ultra combo, everyone in the arcade would hear ultra combo, you know, just <laughs> going across the entire. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, love that that's that was... such an old timey like old Barnum dream. and Bailey era like showman trick of like we got to have the loudest thing in there or else no one will give us their quarters. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. It's so good. All right. Well, um yeah. <laughs> On a Comic lighter players. note, uh yeah. Bloodborne. <laughs> There's some amazing things in chat, but yes, yeah, that it was <laughs> Killer Instinct was so innovative. If I, I'm going to stop talking about it just in case it's on anyone else's three by three, but fantastic game, Bloodborne. Oh, okay, this is when I fell in love with Souls likes. 
right? I'd played Dark Souls, great game. I bought a PS5 specifically because of the Dark Souls remake uh, that was on there. Uh, the Demon's Soul, sorry. Ugh, I said that wrong. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Is it Demon Souls? Am I? What's what's going on in my brain right now? I yeah. forget. It's one of those that I always I always misremember. Demon's yeah. Souls. It was Demon Souls. Demon Souls. And I'd been with I'd been with From Software for a long time. In fact, the very first game I ever streamed on on this channel was Kuon, uh, which is a horror game made by um, by From Software. And I could literally do a nine by nine or a million by nine of horror games that I love. And From Software has made some amazing horror games. Um, but Demon so De- you know, Bloodborne stood out to me over all of the other ones because of the environment, the combo system, the graphics, the story, um, like the theme just so resonates with me. I love this theme so much, and the gameplay. I feel like it just. <laughs> this is going to be controversial. Everyone out there, this is my opinion. I respect your opinion, and I get that Demon Souls might be better, or that uh, Dark Souls might have better controls to you. But for me, Bloodborne is like the way controls should feel. You know, when when I play a game, I'm now comparing it to how does it feel as good as Bloodborne. And I've in recent years, this is the game I put the most hours into. It's the game I'm like, give me a remake, give me a PC version of it. Um, I just love, love, love Bloodborne so much. Um, okay, has anyone else here played it? <laughs> yeah, it seems like this was peak, like Dark Souls era. Like, I mean, I know it's like somewhat separate, but this was after two, right? Dark Souls two, two, and then Bloodborne came out. I just feel like this is when like the fan base was at its peak. Mm. And I, I don't know. I, I just remember it being because I, I I didn't play it myself, but I I spent several amount of time watching my friend play it, just hanging out and stuff, and just going through it. Even though I was passively a part of that gameplay, um, just you know being compelled by the world and the story, and um, it's it really seemed like they they took it to the next level. Yeah. I never got into the series. I never got into those. I, I, I don't know. It, it, I, I've never picked one up. Have you ever played one? I, I actually have not. I have not okay. ever played one of these games. All right. We are going to fix that at some point. Um, we'll, we'll, I, I feel like Bloodborne is such a winter game. We might have to wait till October. <laughs> In fact, maybe, our, maybe Halloween stream will be just like doing a 24 hour fundraiser and we just hand off playing all these <laughs> creepy games because there are games that should have been on this list that aren't like fatal frame uh which oh yeah feels similar to me to some of these so um yeah we got a lot of uh, gaming coming down the pipeline um yeah, but for me, I mean, I think I said what I needed to say about Bloodborne. It, it it is the same thing as Castlevania, where they're so they're so themselves that it's you just got to go out and play it, you know. Um, and I encourage you to play it if you haven't already. Okay, next up, anyone here heard of this game before? <laughs> I remember seeing it in GameStop all the time growing up, but I had never played Eternal Darkness. Jules? Yeah, no, me neither. Okay. Eternal Darkness for the Nintendo GameCube is, I think, a masterpiece. Um, (laughs) Graphically, it's not going to hold up. You know, it's a 3D um, tank-style control, somewhat similar to a Resident Evil-style game. It was heavily focused on the eldritch horror Call of Cthulhu type mythos, and what the thing that really stuck out stood out, stood out to me beyond just the story being great and the gameplay being great is that it messed with you. The game messed with you in ways that were so creative and so fun. Um, this is back in the era where the most common type of television was a CRT. And 
it would like pretend to change the channel to channel four, for example. And for most AV systems at the time, you would be like on channel three to have the audio video coming through, right? Uh huh. Nope. Uh, I, re- I remember that. <laughs> so it would fake pretend that it was like taking you over to a different channel. No, nothing makes us sound older than being like, oh yeah, video games, they only work on channel three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so Eternal Darkness knew what it was. It knew what medium it was on, and it took advantage of that medium, I think, in a really interesting way. Um, there are so many things about this game that make it the game I really wish I could play over again. You know, um, I remember being in, I think I just, I was out of college. I was working at a GameStop and living in like Austin, Texas. And I would go home to my apartment and turn out all the lights and just play this game after work sometimes. And I loved it so much. Um, it w- The other thing that I thought was really unique about it is you played as multiple characters. So you inhabited different people throughout the game. And you had a sanity meter. So for anyone who's played the Call of Cthulhu RPG or is familiar with that, there's this concept that as you experience more and more of these cosmic horror elements, your sanity starts to leave you and reality starts to break down because of that. And the game just incorporated that mechanic so well and built out a story that was so in depth that we need a remake of this game. We need a relaunch of this game. Go and find yourself a way to play eternal darkness. (laughs) That, that immersive channel changing thing seems like uh, that that's compelling I, i'm very interested now <laughs> and i wasn't the only one i'm and i'm sure jules if you went onto youtube you could probably find like a compilation of all the different ways that the game messed with you but as your sanity bar dropped weird things started to happen also that channel changing thing sounds like one of those things where if i was 12 and playing this that would yeah. scare me so much my entire week would be ruined. <laughs> like, as a kid playing it, I could 100% see, like, just just being wrecked by that. Yeah. Well, and and I see in chat that Toth has brought up the fact that, like, they have a friend who is, who is working on a dissertation or working um, in an area where they're studying depictions of mental illness and interactive media and that eternal darkness would most likely be on there along with i'm sure like senria wait what is that one called what is the one i'm thinking of a video game west hell hell um oh it's an xbox game um um oh i can't believe i'm forgetting this toth do you know what i'm talking about there's a fantastic looking game it's it's um oh my gosh what is it about what's it called it's you play as this young uh young woman who's like dealing with these mad like uh, hellfire is it hellfire i can't even describe it um, but anyway, it that game, Sonia's Quest or something like that is what it's the subtitle is for it. It's in this realm with Eternal Darkness, and I okay. apologize that I cannot remember the name of it. Um, oh, Hellblade, I think. Let me see. Yeah, Hellblade. Hellblade is the game. If you all haven't played Hellblade, it's a little bit more accessible. Cool. I know. I've never even heard of that one. Jules? Yeah, I think didn't that one win an award? It, it did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it, yeah. Anyway, I won't go on too long about it. But Eternal Darkness and Hellblade are two games I think that really depict like the distortion of reality as as you deal with different issues and how hard it can be to like perceive what's really going on. Um, but uh, yeah, all right. So Eternal Darkness, we'll add that to our list of games everyone needs to play. Next up, good old-fashioned Metal Gear Solid. Woo. Gotta love the multi-disc. Look at that. Isn't that just grand? 
so epic when you come home with a game like this <laughs> back in the day, having no idea what you were really in for. Oh, because the, oh, the thick, yeah, that thick jewel case. <laughs> Thick jewel case, oh. dual jewel case. Uh, both of the PS games that I brought out tonight are, you know, large dual case. Um, here's the thing about Metal Gear Solid. We'd had Metal Gear on the NES. I don't actually believe that Hideo Kojima was, was a part of the NES version. Um, the... Because uh, I know he did the, the, the PC, like not the PC, but like the whatever the original Amiga or something like that, that it had come out on the original Metal Gear Solid. And then I think a different team in Konami was responsible for moving it over. It's a very, yeah, it's a complicated web of people who were involved in the first couple of rounds of Metal Gear. But Metal Gear Solid invented the stealth genre, in my opinion. <laughs> like, like stealth games had existed, but Metal Gear Solid... You know, it's in the title. It says right there, tactical espionage yeah. action. It, this is the game that I think brought together all of the elements in the way you were wanting them to. Uh, it had a Mission Impossible style intro. It had a narrative that was epic and movie-like. Um, and then it had gameplay mechanics that really spoke to the understanding that like, yeah, we're making an epic story. And while we're inspired heavily by films, we're taking advantage of the uniqueness of video gaming. And we're giving you that story, like the epic sweeping story you'd expect from a major motion picture. But we're also really leaning into the fact that we have this ability to immerse you and to, to mess with you. Anyone who's ever played this and knows what I'm talking about with the Psycho Mantis fight, knows how much mm -hmm. this game likes to mess with you. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've never played a Metal Gear game. I've always wanted to just because like the oh. art and characters have always compelled me. Like The design of the, the Metal Gears and how they have their own unique inspiration to you know prehistoric um, creatures in a way, right? Uh, at least their name. Yeah. Uh, maybe I know nothing about where they or how they were developed in-world, but... I've always been compelled by it. Just never got around to trying one. Yeah, and I would I would recommend either starting with this one or Snake Eater. Those are the two I think that are kind of the peak of what Metal Gear Solid is able to be. Um, I'm looking in right now to see, and I, I think the other thing here too is like the voice acting on on this on this game was fantastic. Um, it was kind of one of the first times voice acting was done to such a great level. Um, I mean, it, it was a little campy, but it wasn't... <laughs> it was campy on purpose, not because, you know, of anything else. It was like, this is a Mission Impossible style a sci-fi military game, you know? <laughs> it it um, definitely feels like... How do I put this? Lore-wise and just how the story unfolds feels like... It's the most anime thing that's not anime in just yeah. how <laughs> trying to describe the plot and the lore of metal gear is sounds like a fever dream sometimes yeah yeah very much so it's like uh gi joe meets like evangelion yeah yes <laughs> thanks Toph, for the gi joe shout out that is true um yeah but i i do want to say one thing like david hater who is the uh H-A-Y-T-E-R, uh, who is the voice actor for Snake. Yes. Like, that was the first time that a character's voice in a video game became as recognizable as, like, a character's voice on television. You know, so it it was just, yeah, Metal Gear Solid. Metal no Gear. No doubt in my mind that had to be on there. <laughs> well, you mentioned it before. Do you want to describe the Psycho Mantis fight um, and what again what kind of makes that fun mm. weird little fight yeah you know i don't know so anyone who hasn't played the psycho mantis fight and doesn't want to be spoiled oh okay i'm gonna give, you a, I'm gonna give you a five second countdown <laughs> so five four three two one when you're playing against psycho mantis you need to plug in your second controller and play with the second controller so that Psycho Mantis can't use its psycho, psycho abilities to know what your moves are. 
Wow. And yeah. So you literally had to say like, okay, I am disembodying the, the psychic connection and playing with the secondary controller so that Psycho Mantis can't read my moves. He also Sonic. had the ability to read your uh, save card. So the game would go into your, your save card and f- figure out what other games you're playing and then start like referencing them. Cause he, he was, he's a guy who's, he's psychic. He can like read your mind. So he reads the player's mind essentially by scanning for other games. And I I just thought that was such a neat little trick. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was pretty fantastic. Um, I think we should move on to the next because I'm realizing we've almost spent an hour and six minutes just on this first slide. <laughs> oh, we, <yeah>. may, <laughs> we may only get through the gaming tonight, y'all. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Then maybe, yeah, maybe we'll come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and a great shout out from Toth and Chat that uh, there is, I think specifically, Psychomantis could read konami games that were on your Uh, yes 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 and one of the things they would say is you like castlevania don't you (laughs) (laughs) that's so good all right next up i don't know if we if i need to really explain this one too much super freaking metroid super metroid it's the reason you wanted a Super NES Mini. It's the reason you want a Super Nintendo. It's the reason you pay for your online subscription to the Switch's online store. <laughs> SNES games. Super Metroid's fantastic. Graphically, amazing. Music, amazing. Power-ups, amazing. Story, amazing. It checks all the boxes. And I think it it is, to me, it represented what made Nintendo special. In mm-hmm. that the quality of the game, there's so much intentionality that, you know, like I work on games, I work on stories, I work on stuff. One of the things that I often feel is missing is that I'm just trying to get the project done. And the thing that Nintendo reminds you is the art is in the revision. So it's not just completing the thing, it's then going back and revising it until it reaches a level of quality that is undeniable. And I think that is the story of super metroid <laughs> have either of you played it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes yeah yeah i played i played some of super metroid i played fusion quite a bit um mm. more of a game boy advance player with the metroid series and metroid hunters different format but um and of course prime but uh yeah i, I feel like um really compelling characters like are also what kind of drew me in i mean samus is like iconic in terms of like her aesthetic and you know ridley and mike ridley and um even the craig world like yeah there's so much that that you can pull from there at least to to be inspired by and and, you know get into but i I feel like i need to play all the way through super metroid specifically because i've heard it's the best one it's it's so good i mean it it definitely i think zero and and metroid is it mother Metroid Mother. Uh, let me double check that. Oh, I'm thinking Other M. Other M. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's not Metroid. Metroid Other. Mm. What is the one that I'm thinking of? Anyway, um, yeah, it. I think it's the one that inspired all the Metroid games that came after. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I don't know if it's the best because I haven't played all of the new ones that that are directly inspired by it. But yeah, it's definitely worth a playthrough. If I could ask you a question, in yeah. the classic Metroidvania title, what series do you like better, Castlevania or Metroid? Oh my goodness! Um, the there is no separation in my mind between those two, if I'm being honest with you, because okay. if, okay, if I was, if push came to shove and someone was like, you can only have <laughs> Castlevania symphony of the night or Metro super Metroid, I would take Castlevania symphony of the night because okay. of the theming, right? Yeah. Not necessarily because of the gameplay mechanics, but the theming resonates so well with me. But 
I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to be in a world as a gamer <laughs> who didn't have a Castlevania <laughs> or and and like I grew up playing both. I remember where I was the first time I beat Mother Brain in the original NES version, and I remember how long of a night that was. Like trying over and over and over again and then finally beating mother brain in the original metroid so the metroid series and the castlevania series like i i could i could have brought my nes collection up here and i have all of those because they're just so fantastic this um, is one of the dangers of of the nine favorites and um i feel like i had to if i had overlapping genre i had to decide to save room for the others basically <laughs> Mm, yeah oh i see what yeah so uh in chat Toth just mentioned that they think that metroid embodies the genre much more thoroughly um as for which i think like better it varies yeah I, I i think you're right i think the super metroid puts the is the game mechanic that is what makes a metroidvania game nowadays and i and i think that might be why the metroid is the root of that word right i think you're right i think it is the root of that word um okay next wrap it on up least, final fantasy 7 kind of covering the like, image there i i uh i um i've got a copy of it right here i'm going to tell you all that this was the hardest one right because I love JRPGs. I love RPGs as long as they don't have, um, what is it called? Uh, like random attacks, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. which this game does, but th that tends to be the, the one thing I dislike is the random attacks. But I, and I know this one has it, but um, I mean, this game, I think from the television commercials to the soundtrack, the graphics, there was, there was never a game that had, for me, that I had experienced such an event like, um, ha it was like a happening, you know, kind of like Mortal Kombat when Mortal Mondays happened. It was everywhere on television. You had no idea what the game was going to be like. It came in this massive, you know, like jewel case with. I have to be careful because these discs, you know, they, they like to fall out of these kind of cases. But three discs, man, spanning three discs with all these great, like, the cover art and everything in here. Um, this game was an event. It, uh, I was in college when it came out. Like, five or six friends came over when it released. Um, like, just a big group of friends all got together. And we all just sat down on the couch and turned it on and played like 10 hours straight of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I remember one friend, she left, she left for work and came back immediately after work just to continue watching us play. <laughs> but the, the storyline, the graphics, the, you know, it, it just, there's a reason that these games are, like there, I love so many of the Castlevania. Uh, sorry, the Final Fantasy games. I played the original. I played, you know, the U.S. release that was titled Three. I think there was six in Japan. All fantastic games. What stood out to me about Final Fantasy VII was it was the it was the first AAA game, as Toph just said. It was the first game that it was like like Metal Gear Solid. It brought all the elements together, and it just did everything so perfectly. It had such a great sense of humor to it. It had tragedy. I mean, there's a moment in this game that we will not spoil because, you know, so many people are playing Final Fantasy VII for the first time because of Rebirth and um, the the new versions that are coming out. Um, but it had a moment in it that literally made everyone cry, right? Like, everyone cried multiple times in this game. And it just was so immersive it was such a big event that um, it had such great the characters are so good and it, you know it's it's just i think it deserves its place in history and yes there are other final fantasy games that also deserve their place in history but um yeah final fantasy 7 
I think really broke RPGs into the mainstream in the U S and really set the bar for what a triple a game was. Well, it's also just one that they keep coming back to. They, mm-hmm. you know, they've made so many more final fantasy games, but this is the one where, you know, the, um, the characters show up in kingdom hearts. They, you know, they've remade the game. They've made sequels of the game. They've like this game has gotten treatment that no other game in the series has gotten. And I think there's yeah. there's a reason for it. And it's like you said, it's it's a achievement of both video games, JRPGs, and also it was like you said, it was just a moment in time where this yeah. game was the biggest thing for for a long time (laughs) i agree and jules have you played this i haven't played seven specifically i've played tactics uh crystal chronicles um and then i think i think it was three i played one of them for the ds that um i think it was three on the ds but um, was it the one that starts with the mechs walking in the snow uh no, I have played that one though. <laughs> okay, that's yes. I, I, do you mean three or in the US. quotation marks three? <laughs> I, yeah, think it was echoes of time. <laughs> I think it was echoes of time. But okay, yeah, and then of course the um, I also played the MMO um, quite recently. Um, I was pretty yeah. intrigued by it as well. Um, but I haven't played seven. I know I should. I saw the movie, like the the short film they made, which I thought was also really cool. Advent of Children or. I think yeah. <laughs> it's a while ago. Well, it's interesting because the success of Final Fantasy VII, I think, set up uh, Square before it became Square Enix. Mm-hmm. It set up SquareSoft to make their first major motion picture, and it completely flopped. Oh, I remember that within. the Final Fantasy yeah. movie with James yeah. Woods as the villain. Oh my god, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I saw that in the theaters with my dad, and he kept asking me like. Uh, so is this like a story in the game? And I'd be like, no, it's not. It's its own story. And it was just like, oh, so yeah. how does it connect to the, the games? It was like, it kind of doesn't. I mean, there's crystals in it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think for from a technological perspective, it was mind blowing. But the story was, you know, it's one of those things when it, it's like we were talking about. There's a difference between games and there's a difference between movies. And I think it's. I'm sure there's a name for this, but the beats in between the story that unfold the story in a game, right? So, like, I think The Last of Us is a great example of this. I've actually never played The Last of Us video games, uh, but I did watch the show that came out, um, and I've watched friends play The Last of Us. But, you know, I think it's the easiest one to use as a descriptor for this, where... There are moments in the game where you and Ellie are moving through the world. And as you move through the world, the story of the world is being told, right? And that can happen in much more depth than a video game and in a much more immersive way in a video game than I think it can in film. And I think the challenge of the Final Fantasy movie was it was being made by people who want, who, who, who wrote the beats, like who wrote great stories, but they were only great because they were glued together by the, the the gameplay beat, like the gameplay loop that gave you more of the world, and you did not get that in the movie. They did not know how to translate that in the movie. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I feel like, um, and maybe the animated movie I'm thinking of, um, I mean, just thinking of the parallel, the cinematic um approach that kingdom hearts took i felt like Mm. is also kind of where all of that storytelling could have taken place like if they went full animated series like maybe they still will i don't know uh, with final fantasy um i just feel like there's a lot of room there there's so much room there and i'm I'm just gonna hold this up the uh, the game manual i love the artwork on this i mean it really was like dungeons and dragons (laughs) <laughs> you know, like it's just such a big world. So many amazing things happen in the game. Um, yeah, and I remember getting the strategy guide. It was like the first time I bought a strategy guide for a game. Um, oh yeah, it was just so big. It was so big. I going um, off of that, 
and the fact that you have a giant jewel case full of C, you know, the game CDs. I remember one of the most epic moments, if I'm remembering this correctly, the first disc is just Midgar. It is just the opening city. Yeah. It is every like cuz you are in this kind of slum sort of cyberpunky kind of city for a good chunk of the game before you ever put foot on the world map. And I remember yeah. that being such a thing is you kind of close act one, you close the first disc and you pop in the second disc and that's you entering the world map for the first time. And it's just, I don't know. It was just such a moment as a kid where it's just like, I've completed this big chunk of story and now, holy crap, there's so much more to this world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it was epic in scope and it did not it, it's one of those games that it lived up to the hype it delivered and it's a classic for for that reason i think okay well uh it's time to move on to the next slide um i feel like i feel like tonight we're probably only going to get through the gaming section of I, this. Hey, that's uh, okay <laughs> we'll see because i i feel like we're talking a lot about the games because there's a lot of significance there. Not to say there's not significance in the Twitch streamers we follow or the, uh, I just don't think we, I don't think there's as much in depth to d discuss. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just see how it flows. But also next? it's the it's thing that I feel is that now that we're like picking stuff, I now want to like repick stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like for my other things for the, like the YouTube stuff and we're like, oh man, I want to come with some more cool stuff than, I mean, not that I didn't pick cool stuff. I just, I'm like, what if I could think of cooler stuff? I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I I'm, I, let's, let's find out what you picked. <laughs> yeah, let's let's go. Go. All right, here we go. All right. Oh okay. Okay. Whoa. Okay. I will uh, explain some things. Also, Thoth is um, is reminding me that I'm not quite correct about where the disc changes. But you know what? That's my childhood memory. I uh, I choose to remember it the way I remember it. Uh, <laughs> Let's um, go. All right. Anyway. <clears throat> so, jumping on in. Um, again, it's one of those things where I'm going to say for a lot of these, it's, uh, you know, I'm not saying these are like the most important games of all time or even the best, but these are the games that I think me growing up probably informed me the most, especially when I was a kid. Um, so let's just get started. Okay. Number one, Earthbound for the Super Nintendo. Have either of you played this game? Yes. Or I, have. no, I haven't. Okay. Um, also known as Mother 2 in Japan. Uh, it, is a, it is a Super Nintendo JRPG. And one thing I will say that I really loved about this game being used to a lot of other JRPGs that are set in a very high fantasy world, this game is a modern day RPG. It's set in, if I am actually remembering, I believe it is specifically set in the year 1990X. It is like, it's supposed to be in the year of sometime vaguely in the 90s um, when it was, when it came out. And it is the story about um, uh, just a young suburban boy who wakes up in the middle of the night because an asteroid has landed, you know, essentially in his backyard. And now a great evil alien force is uh, come to destroy, <laughs> destroy the Earth uh, and all of Eagle Land. There's a lot of one of the things about this game that I really appreciated is just its it's weirdness it had if you have not played it, it is hard to describe but it is one of the most enjoyable things because the way i would describe it it is it's a, it's a game made in japan that's essentially an homage slash parody of american and you know european culture 
and then retranslated and localized back to America. So it's this weird kind of looking at a mirror to a mirror to a mirror of what like American life is like. And it is just a, it's a wonderful sort of weird joy. Like, and all the characters, instead of, you know, using magic powers, it's, you know, you use psychic powers and instead of swords, you're fighting with, bottle rockets and baseball bats and 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 so oh, and instead of like getting gold coins what you do is you <laughs> you fight you fight monsters and depending on how many monsters you fight you can call up your dad who is not like around but you speak to him on the phone and he deposits money into your bank account and you have an ATM card and that you pull out money from. Um, it's, it, it is truly one of those things. I just, it is just such a pure, like, I don't know. I just, it's, I have so much love for this game. And again, it's, you sort of travel through these weird kind of, you know, Americanized cities, like you go through different suburbs. There's one town that's essentially like a Halloween town that's overrun by zombies. There's like, you go to a cool big city, you go to like, somehow you end up in like prehistoric times, but it just all flows together, like weirdly naturally. And it also has really beautiful moments. One of the th- moments that I love from this game and is it takes time to there's this moment kind of about halfway through the game um, where essentially it's like your character's like you've reached this point you've got three out of the four members of the party you are you know you fought your way through like sort of a bunch of bosses and then your character essentially just kind of like gets this moment where they just get to sit and relax and then the whole game just switches to this monologue and it's this sort of the game starts not talking to you as Ness it starts talking to you as the player and Mm. it starts breaking the fourth wall and having this moment of like hey you fought really hard and you've you've come a long way and you should be really proud of yourself and you know, I'm glad you're taking this moment just to sit and relax. And it's like the music starts to sort of like play this kind of like soft, you know, old chip toony lo-fi. And there's no plot to that moment. There's no like thing you're achieving. It's just a little moment of like, hey, we know you're a player and yeah. we know that you've, you know, you know, you, I hope you're enjoying the story. And I don't know why that was such a, an affecting moment to me as a kid is just like, it's like, oh yeah, you're right. I'm I'm a kid on an adventure, much like Nessus, <laughs> and That's like I have the, been working uh, hard at this. From it's like it it almost sounds like the rock scene from uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once, where I... you, a breath can can really have a powerful narrative impact. Yeah, and yeah. other wonderful things about this game. Um, uh. They used, okay, they did, they ha, the way they created the music for this game, the music is great, is they actually used a lot of sampling from ex- pre-existing songs. Um, there are There's a fight song where it is clear that they ripped part of it from Johnny Be Good. Uh, mm. There is a, I think, uh, Good Morning or... Something from Sergeant Peppers. There's another song where you can just hear these little like in and out riffs that are just clearly like taken from the Beatles, but they're right. not just like totally stealing the songs. They're like reworking them into new songs. And I don't know. It creates this. Like I said, it's not. It's such a non-realistic world. You're fighting zombies right. and aliens. There's a famous character named Mr. Saturn who's this little pink alien who talks in a weird font. But it's it feel it makes the world just feel like this is my world. It's magic and fantasy, but it's 
the actual world I live in. There's people who drive cars and you go to shopping malls to buy weapons and stuff like that. And it was just such a beautiful, unique take on all the other JRPGs that I was playing that I, it's, I don't know. It's, I just love it, love it, love it still to this day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think Earthbound, what I find so interesting about this is that Earthbound is a classic that became a classic, right? It's like a cult mm-hmm. classic because advertising wise, when it first came out, you didn't know what the game was. You know, it had the the weird robot on the front cover. Mm-hmm. It like nothing about. And I remember there were scratch and sniff stickers that were in game magazines for the game. Like it the advertising never told you what the game was and i've i've never beaten earthbound i've never played it all the way through i won't uh, tell you how the ending but you beat the final boss in a in a very beautiful way and like i said the only mild not it's not a spoilery thing but there is a point again like two thirds of the way through the game because you have a cell phone and you get phone calls from people. And there was a point when one of the character calls and calls you the player. And it specifically says that it's like, Hey, Ness, I'm not talking to you. I actually want to talk to you, the person with the controller. What's your name? Write in your name. Please tell me who you are. And that comes up later in the ending in a very, beautiful way i i i won't i I feel like i'm spending too much time on earthbound i'll move on quicker but um i i just yeah i will also say yes they did have this scratch and sniff things because they didn't know how to advertise it so they tried to play a lot on this weird gross out humor for kids that really wasn't in the game but they're like kids like farts and poop and other stuff so they tried to make it a real gross out ad campaign i don't know yeah i think outside of maybe having wanting wanting to go back in time and buying like twelve thousand dollars of bitcoin in 2010 (laughs) um i would i would also like to have uh picked up a big box copy because they they had these earthbound came in a in a normal size box and then they also had these really big box copies and uh, you can't get them now for any less than like a thousand. But yeah, uh, actually, the last thing I'll say before I moved on. So yes, it famously came with a player's guide uh, when you bought mm. it back in the day. Uh, I, f- I think the reasoning was I don't know why they ha- they made so many weird marketing choices when this game came out. I think one of them they thought was like no kid's going to understand how to play this game or what this game is. So we got to include a player's guide with every copy. Uh, So yeah, when you bought it in the store, you bought this giant eight by 11 inch box. Um, The player's guide was gorgeous and they put a ton of love into it, even though it was something they were kind of like forced to make. And all I will say before I move on is I have a friend that I met in second grade and I borrowed his earthbound player's guide and I lost it. And we have known each other now for three decades. And he still brings that up every year that, he, that I owe him an earthbound strategy guide. I think it's time for you to find one, buy it and, and deliver it as this year's Christmas. Be gift. like, this is our friendship over. <laughs> All right, <laughs> moving on. Um, game I'm currently playing on stream right now. Subnautica. Um, One of the reasons why I love this game is it totally... I go back and forth on crafting games and survival games for whatever reason. Subnautica has just clicked in my mind of like, you are... It's set in the future. You are on a spaceship that for some reason uh, crash lands and you're probably the only survivor of your spaceship crash landing on this water planet and you have barely any resources. And so basically you have nothing but like clear open ocean in front of you and a life pod. And your job is to figure out how the hell do I survive and get back home? And it is, is one of my favorite games because I love um, I love underwater horror. I love being creeped out by the sea. I love um, sort of that feeling of like, oh, I'm very tiny and there are things that are very big. And playing the game, 
there are many things much, much, much bigger than you lying in the darkness that are much better at swimming than you are. And <laughs> it is one of those games that you might not realize at first is a horror game because it doesn't necessarily yeah, no, feel yeah. like Resident Evil or Silent Hill. But as you play it, you realize you have that feeling that those games give you of just feeling, I'm small, I'm helpless. Everything else here is so much better equipped at survival than I am. <laughs> this game mm. captured like ocean swimming ocean survival really well like, oh yeah the way that the physics and the sound design and the visuals all match together like there's a like there's deep stranded there's some other ocean survival games but this one had that extra la layer of like polish to every little detail and like even the way the sea moth like the first time you get in your sea moth and you do your like thrust through like the current like you know it's like rushing past you and yeah yeah it's such, such an amazing game I'm glad this is on this awesome. list. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also the one thing about survival games and this game in particular is those little moments where you start to figure shit out. Where you're like, I built this little tiny like hover ship or whatever. And you just have these moments of like, okay, I'm maybe not totally 100% screwed. And I love those little mini victories that you get <laughs> along the way. Like, you feel very accomplished. So, uh, Jules, I I've actually never played this game, y'all. But I I for me, Jules, it I'm, I'm calling you out specifically because you and I worked together on some virtual reality stuff. And that's when I became aware of Subnautica because it was one of the first games that had the VR implementation added to it. And then I think it eventually got taken away because so few people were using it. Mm -hmm. But I've never played it. I've only ever seen uh, Simon and then Hey Shady Lady play it on stream. Um, but it sounds like one I need to add to my list. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny you mentioned that just because like the parallel with that VR thing was just environmental impact and what are some of the like connections we can make through interactive media. And uh, I actually feel like there's a piece of that in Subnautica because you've got this spaceship that's landed in this ocean environment, this reef, and you're now seeing the aftermath as a, as a survivor and already like the radioactivity from the spaceship, the, the scrap and the excess, like the environment is already adapting to that for better or worse. Mm. So there is kind of like this footprint kind of, um at least in the beginning of the game like you, you see that right away um yeah it's pretty upfront. and simon uh, did you play the expansion of this recently on stream is it like a new an update or uh, a dlc for it uh so there is subnautica below zero which i have not played yet mm. um oh, okay but i believe that's a proper sequel awesome all right, so I will I will move on. Okay, so Akira Toriyama recently passed away. Yeah, I'm famous for Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, just giant name in anime. And what I will say is obviously Dragon Ball <laughs> deserves to be remembered. For me, the way I remember Akira Toriyama was Chrono Trigger. That was mm. the that was one of the most important games of my childhood. And without his art direction on that game, I, I just I just cannot imagine it. It is that I, it he is so good at creating. Um, just his own world and just characters that feel fantastical and lived in and goofy and who the hell else could have drawn them or created <laughs> them this way. But I, so it is set. If, if you've not, uh, if you've never played Chrono Trigger, actually, first off, have either of you played Chrono Trigger? No, unfortunately I have played it, not beat in it. Okay. Was that Jules? Sorry. Uh, no, no, I haven't. Um, I've only heard the soundtrack. It's about, Oh, God, the soundtrack. Uh, I don't want to get sidetracked because the I the sound. Okay, the soundtrack to this game is so good. That's that was like my study music for years. I would, I like it is like honestly not even. 
<laughs> I I was dating someone and I would play that and she'd be like, this music is so good. And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, it's to a video game. And then it, she, I think she'd just be like, damn it. I like this. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so the story is it's set in uh, kind of a, you know, a, a, uh, sort of medievalish renaissance time, not really in that, like, more in an anime kind of Middle Ages than a, like, actual mm. peasant surf Middle Ages. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's set in this time period. And you just play a young boy who, kind of in a classic fable sort of way, um, goes to the fair and meets some random girl turns out this girl is actually the princess of the whole like town and she's just kind of pretending to be a normal girl and like just so she can go experience life as a normal person you make best friends with her she ends up getting um sort of thrown through time and so by hanging out with your sciencey nerd friend, um, you have to go through time to go rescue this princess. Um, and it becomes this sort of one of the coolest things about this game is you the entire world map exists, but you get to traverse to through different time periods yeah, where that's cool. you the first jump you go to is the like actual medieval time period where you Be go with spoilers <laughs> okay this is like the first 15 minutes of a very long okay. game <laughs> so if this is one of the this is one of the games that's on your classic list that you can <sighs> actually still play and you can get oh on yeah Steam and other places yeah yeah i will i will i i am only spoiling let's say not even episode <laughs> one of of a, of a whole okay. mini series <laughs> Um, gotcha. let's just say this is the instigating thing that gets you to go back in time and throughout mm. your time hopping, you, you know, quickly reconcile the whole princess thing. But uh, through this time hopping, you find out there's a much bigger, darker evil threatening the entire world. So you in the classic JRPG way, you go and you kind of meet a bunch of friends and form this found family, but everyone's from different time periods and That's you have cool. people from the future. You have a cave woman, you have a medieval knight who, uh, yeah. And then it, it's, it is a beautifully designed game. The art design is perfect. The music is perfect. The it's just so wonderfully fun. It is one of those pieces of art that I just, it's just perfect. I just cannot possibly say how just complete of a, of a game it feels like <laughs> that's awesome yeah and you know it's funny because i've never beaten the game i've obviously heard of it i've never played it beyond just like a little bit but i the characters like luca mm -hmm. and the frog the frog knight you know they're also yep. in, instantly recognizable to even someone like me who's never played it so it had yeah. a huge impact i think and it was also one of those games where s there are different approaches to the final bad guy you could actually very early in the game you you basically are presented with a time portal where it could it's just straight up like hey you want to go beat the bad guy right now right this second here 25 percent of the game there's a portal hop in it go kill him i mean you'll get wrecked because you're super weak and he's super strong but if you feel like you could do it right now go do it um and there's there were multiple approaches of how you could complete the game, which was also very fun. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, before we go to your next one, because I know your next one's going to be a revolutionary one, I just really want to quickly shout out to anyone who's watching who hasn't already donated. To, uh, I think um, I think. Uh, I think the description and the, the links are still down below in my bio, but we are raising funds over the next couple of weeks for uh, Floppy Ear Rescue uh, out in Florida, and there should be a donation link in my um, in my descriptor. And then if anyone else, if uh, Simon Fox, if you want to throw it into your chat, uh, just know that that's there. Um, and sorry for the brief interruption, interruption no. there. 
Simon. It's just that Fergie, who you have taken care of before, is sitting right behind me watching me stream. And she looks a little upset at me, so I'm going to go throw her some treats real quick. <laughs> and then I can't wait to talk about the next one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I do have... Um... Right this second, I know I have it in my About page. If you are following me on Twitch, you can pop over to my About page to go to that uh, charity. Yeah, we've been raising some money for, for buns. Because, uh, as and I'm repeating facts that um, J.O. Camp has told me, but they are the third most adopted pet uh, in the country. And they do take spe very specific types of care. I think... It's one of those that I learned from pet sitting for you, for bunny sitting for you. Yeah, they 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 are very different from dogs and cats. Yeah. They take their own special type of love. And you know, it's I I this charity I know means a lot to Jail Camp and, and to myself. So yeah, if you have any if you have any coin, please, please share with this charity. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, let's get back to the games there. Thank you so much, Jules, for the donation. Um, I appreciate that. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, the next one's a big one. You're, you're about to <laughs> enter earth-chattering territory with your whole next line. So sorry for the brief interruption there. Please continue. Okay. It's also very funny. You can tell... Because this, I all of this is what I consider my formative years in video games. Um, <laughs> so you could probably age me about how old I am by just looking at these nine squares. Um, so, Mario Paint. This was one that I almost skipped it. Like, I was trying to think of, like, what are the games that I loved as a kid that meant the most to me? And... This game, uh, it's like so weird to think where it's like, I almost didn't think of it despite the fact that it like on reflection, I was like, oh, I put hours into this game. This game was, okay, so what I love about this game and what I love about Nintendo in general, especially maybe this era of Nintendo is you could tell that people got into an office and they were like, okay, we have to do something different. What can we as Nintendo do that's radically different than anything else we've ever done before that we could put our specific mark on? And so on the Super Nintendo, there was a game called Mario Paint. For a lot of people, a lot of people of my generation, this was the first time you put a computer mouse in your hand. Mm -hmm. I would say that if you had this game, this was from a time period where a lot of people didn't own home computers yet. And it came with a mouse. It came with a like little rollerball mouse that was its own separate accessory. I do not know if they made another game that the mouse even worked as an accessory for. I'm sure maybe they did i guess but this is the only one i can think of um mario paint wasn't necessarily a game exactly it was <laughs> it essentially was a very <laughs> proto version of the adobe creative cloud <laughs> um yeah it it you could you could be given and this is going to sound so stupid basic to like any kid nowadays but you basically could it had like a paint program where you could just like mm -hmm. click little different colors and size and type of brush and then you just were given an easel and you could just paint whatever you wanted uh or if you wanted to you can uh make little tiny rudimentary animations and i'm talking like four cells to nine cells something like that you there was a music program where you were given a certain amount of bars like a you know and you could write in like classic musical notation a song and it would play it back to you and you were given a whole list of like you know not just like a b c d e of like the the notes like you had little <laughs> 
<laughs> like the Mario head, if you like, if that was your note, it would play like a piano. If it was a Yoshi, it would make a little Yoshi sound. If it was a dog, it'd make a little barky sound. Um, it, it, like, and, and then you'd end up just making really stupid, silly songs. And yeah, and you got. I, I was going to add to that that there are a lot of. I think there are a lot of musicians who still use Mario Paint. I know that there are like you if you look up Mario Paint musicians you'll find a couple of pretty famous musicians that are and both in the chiptune world and outside of the chiptune world that use Mario Paint as a way to make music. Yeah. So, and uh you can do a lot with it. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Thoth, uh, you brought up something good where he says it's more like a toy than a game. And mm. yeah, exactly. And I think that's what made this so cool and interesting is you it, like your Super Nintendo now became something different. Like yeah. it became its own. It's now a new thing. It now creates art with you. And it also had this silly little feature where like <laughs> it it brought it all together where you could take your 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 drawing you could then add the music you wrote as a soundtrack and then you could take your animation you made and then you can put your animation over the soundtrack and the painting and make a very rudimentary cartoon if you are old yeah, enough and- you might remember homestar runner yes <laughs> that started, though, if you could correct me, the, the very early beginnings of it. Um, ha! He just brought it up as, as I was saying it. Um, <laughs> the, the Homestar Runner people, that's how they got their start. Is that you could, you could take your VHS tape and you could put it in. You could record your little animation sound for like, you know, the four seconds. Stop make a new paint like situation hit record again and some of the original rudimentary homestar runner cartoon things that they would make was on mario paint just that's within... awesome i didn't i did not know that about the brothers chap yeah that's awesome <laughs> um jules i feel like you would you would be able to use this program nowadays to do some of the work you do yeah yeah so i, I mean there's uh i could see it being like a even for someone just getting into like at the time when this release, like getting into sequencing and, uh, you know, uh, setting up arpeggios, uh, that that format is probably a really good entry point for musicians, um, even now today, like you guys are saying. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and I think a lot of visual artists and and computer animators, like, I'll watch YouTubers who are pixel artists or graphic designers or even people who use Blender and they're like, yeah, my first, my first, what my first system was Mario Paint, as you mentioned, Simon Fox. So I, I do think I want to, I want to add my voice to this, that you, this is this, I'm so glad to see this game on here. I would have never thought to have put this on my own, but it is like, I think another one of those quintessential revolutionary products. Yeah. Um, it changed. It changed the world in a lot of different ways that we can't even express here because it influenced so many people to make the games and the music that we listen to today. And it was very, it was accessible to kids without totally being condescending to kids. Yeah, it was. It gave you a bunch of tools, and it was the tools that a second grader could use to make music, to make this stuff. It wasn't like sitting down at like an Adobe software where you just like, I got to learn 80 different things to pilot this cockpit. But it also wasn't so rudimentary that like you couldn't do cool stuff with it. And that's yeah. that's why I love it so much. Um, awesome. Before moving on, I will. I just have to acknowledge there was one game inside of it that had nothing to do with art. It was a game where you had a little fly swatter and you just had to swat bugs and that was the whole game and you'd swat bugs and at the end of the level a really big bug would come out and you had to swat it a whole bunch of times and it <laughs> i don't know it was it was just it was a very fun game and uh it was, it was called nat attack apparently <laughs> yes it was or, also uh, Weisswater, one of those two yeah it was like oddly um, hard and you played it with a mouse yeah 
I, I will add just just because I put it in my chat, and you are welcome to copy and put it in your chat. In your chat, this game was so revolutionary that the gaming historian, which is a fairly famous famous gaming YouTube channel, they have a forty five minute documentary on the story behind Mario Paint, and <laughs> uh, you should watch it. It's so good. Awesome pick. I'll check it out. Cool. All right. So I will sort of combine the next two together a little bit um, because uh, for sake of like, I want to get to Jules's picks here pretty soon. And also because <laughs> I think of these kind of as a unit of me as a kid. Mm. So um, Final Fantasy 2 and 3, as they were in America on the Super Nintendo when I played them. Um but in reality, they were Final Fantasy four and six. Um, here's what I'll say: going back to what you had to say about Final Fantasy seven, uh, these were my touchstones. This is what I had growing up, and these were my entry into the world of JRPG. Not just JRPGs, but like the concept that games could be bigger like then mm. just a uh, side scrolling platformer something beyond just Mario and Sonic these were my entries into like oh you could feel sad at a video game you could feel <laughs> anxious you could like feel like you could feel a cinematic hype over what were at these times 2D 16 bit games um i the they're both wonderful, obviously, in that classic sort of Final Fantasy, like, you know, medieval fantasy by way of, you know, Japan anime-ish kind of tropes. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's stuff that I think, you know, has been we've talked about in other stuff where, again, it's the it's is beautiful art direction. It's beautiful music and it's storytelling in a way that I think kind of blew my mind when I was like in third and fourth grade. <laughs> um, and also like the concept of like, I'm going to play a game and I'm, it, it's going to feel like reading a book. It's going to be a mm. thing where yeah. as the game goes on, characters are changing. Like the world is changing. I feel like things are like getting deeper and deeper. And by the time I'm done with this, I feel a sense of catharsis that, that, you know, beating like a side scroller is not going to make me feel. I'm going to feel like I carried these characters on a journey <laughs> that I like in a way that a lot of other games don't make you feel. And I really love that, you know, it's on the Super Nintendo. <laughs> it's such yeah, an old, I mean, such an old game. <laughs> I think now that you bring it up, like, yeah, it it really did have like a cinematic quality to it, especially like I can't speak as much to Final Fantasy four, but Final Fantasy six. Yes. That introduction with the um, with the oh, my gosh, mode seven intro where it's like scaling over. Oh, yes. Um, and it's the, like the mechs as they move through the snow. I mean, it's amazing. And there's like opening credits. Like, I gotta check something. Yeah. But yeah, like the the fact that there's like opening credits to the game is like as you are this soldier in these like mech suits, and there's this kind of introduction of like this is a world where magic and science kind of went to war with each other and now it's kind of settled down and you're in this post-war period and this is kind of the universe and it's also very like you know it's very melancholy it's very dark but in a very like sensual kind of art style that the artist who i am totally forgetting their name and i feel so bad because i love that artist who did all of the artwork art design for oh. final fantasy 6 um but yeah it's that you open on this feeling of this like weird you're in this like big industrial magic robot and you're with these soldiers who are just kind of like doing this like like you're kind of like the for lack of a better word you're kind of like the ss of this like little small european village and you're just kind of like 
going in to inspect this town and like everything's snowy and dark and it's it's i don't know it just felt very serious and uh in a way that i don't know i just really appreciate what they're able to do in like the mid 90s on a super nintendo <laughs> oh yeah, yoshi yoshi awesome. taka amano yes thank you to both yes and and on, on if you're in my chat, Toth just dropped some links to a Super NES um, works, which is this big retrospective of um, of the game. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but just know that's what those links are. Yeah, this is. I think these two are like you don't get a Final Fantasy VII without these, and they they are probably on par, if not equally as good. And I think that's one of those things where it's like these games are so good that it the generational leap doesn't matter as much because the craft is so fantastic. And yeah. if I had played these, if I had played Final Fantasy VI first, there's a part of me that feels like that would have been on my list versus Final Fantasy VII. So there's like a nostalgia play on that as well. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's also where you got on the train. The, uh, these like Final yeah. Fantasy six and and four are very much the Iggy Pop to the punk movement that was like Final Fantasy seven. <laughs> <laughs> like like these are the like you can see them figuring out the things that will completely land hard and make yeah. Final Fantasy seven such the super hit that it was. So and Jules, you did you have something to add there? Sorry. Uh no, I don't think so. Um I mean like like I've shared before, mostly paid like spin off still canon, you know, games, but I feel like I need to just stick to one of the mainline games and I feel like six seems like the, the contender here to just yeah, go six in and fantastic. Do if, if I if you have to play one, play six. Because six is truly the like that's a great one. I'm also including four because Four totally deserves a lot of love. I played it a ton as a kid. Um, six is the if you have to pick one or the other, just do six. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and four got a remake, right? Um, like in 3D, or unless I'm mistaken. Yes, four also got a a sequel that I actually played about ten or so years ago. That was uh, kind of interesting. Nintendo was, I think, releasing like it, it was like in. It didn't, they were releasing a sequel to Final Fantasy IV as like an episodic game mm. where you could play each part, and it was still a, a top-down 2D sort of thing. Uh, it was interesting. It was kind of cool. Um, yeah, yeah, these, it, yeah. these ones, though, I do feel like if you can, play the original. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think... Here's what I'll say. I think if you do get a copy of Final Fantasy VI with the updated remake graphics... Yeah, you know what? That's totally. I think it's totally valid to not play the 16 bit. I don't. I'm not so hipster that I think you have to play only the way I played it as a fifth grader. But the only thing that does upset me is that in one of the 3D renderings of Kefka, who's like the main bad guy, he. I'm mad because they rendered him in a way that I don't think he looked like in my head when I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> they make him look more like a juggalo than and, I thought he was. <laughs> and that's the only... You can play... <laughs> Sorry, you can play these on the Nintendo Switch. And I yeah. think that's the reason I'm recommending... Like My personal recommendation is the SNES versions um, or the GBA version as Toth brought up because they there's something about the the quality of the artwork not that not to say the new ones are bad but like that was peak pixel graphics you know that i think that's uh, actually a good point because this is the last 2D final fantasy game and also you're kind of yeah. getting at the end of the 2D games and what's also yeah. really beautiful about final fantasy 6 is this is the there's a lot of amazing current indie games you can buy on Steam right now where people are amazing at making pixel art. This is the last, like, of its generation of we have to make pixel art video games. And this is the end of that era. And this is the best we've gotten <laughs> at making pixel art. Is like It's kind of in that little slot before everything switches over to uh, 3D graphics and i just think that it's you know it's a beautiful moment in time to see how how good it was 
Yeah, awesome picks. Yeah. I'm so curious to hear about the next one. Okay. I, I, I know people who are still playing this game. Oh, God. Okay. So, I remember there being a game called Ultima Online. And I remember having friends who played this game called Ultima Online. And I remember going to my mom and explaining the concept of a video game that you had to pay for every month. The concept that you got a game, and she didn't really like me playing video games. Like, all of these games that I played came in, I don't know how it entered my household, because it was against my mom's wishes for, like, to us to even play games. So, like, I think every one of these was, like, my brothers bought it with, like, lawnmower money, or some uncle who didn't know that my mom didn't want us to have it, like, gave it to us. And every time it was, like, such a gem to own a video game, because it was, like, against my parents' wishes. So, explaining the concept of Ultima Online, uh, where she was like, no, I'm not gonna pay for that. I'm not gonna buy you a game every month. <laughs> like, no. I don't know how. I think my brother finally start. you know what it was? My brother finally got his first job uh, working in a restaurant at like 14, 15. And with his money, he purchased EverQuest. And mm. EverQuest, precursor to World of Warcraft, precursor to all of these sort of massively multiplayer online games. It was not the first, but it was it was. It was big before all of those things that got big got big. Um, it is a massively multiplayer fantasy game set in a fantasy universe. Very classic sort of D&D-ish sort of characters and classes. Um, and I think when my brother was feeling nice, he would allow me to make my own character and join in and, and play when he wasn't wanting to play. And... It was one of those experiences where I, it was, again, as I've sort of talked before, experiencing something different where you're playing something and you're like, this is different than any, this is a different sort of game. This is different than anything I've ever experienced before. I'm not fighting against just pre-rendered pixels on a story that someone's written on a path that someone has laid out for me. This is a thing where I am picking a character who just by my race has other human beings who are now my enemies and other ones who are now my allies. And I have to be in a, in a certain city. And if I walk into certain other cities, those players will kill me. And yeah. I will talk to other people who are other human beings experiencing this game right along with me. Um, I remember being a, a novice player, like level one or level two, and like just some level 50 characters coming up to me and mugging me and just being like, give me your money or I'll kill you. And just being like, ah, crap. Ah, ah, I don't want, like an experience I'm not gonna get from like an other game. Um, was like, oh, I'm being bullied. <laughs> um, it was one of those things I loved a lot of this game. Also, just like it was a giant 3D world where you could just go, and I just loved exploring. I loved just, I don't know. It felt like a shared universe and by exploring in the woods and the mountains and sometimes accidentally going to a place that was way higher level than I ever was and like getting myself in trouble and trying to figure out how to get out of it. Uh, I don't know. It was just an experience that I've never had. I never really got into world of Warcraft. I never really got into these sorts of games. Again, this is really my only touch point in you know, massively multiplayer online games, but I think it was my introduction to internet gaming and just what the internet could do. And yeah. that's why I loved it because I think it showed me, it it showed me the possibilities of the internet and video games and experiences in, I don't know, in a way I never had before. Yeah. I mean, uh, Jules, do you have any memories of this game before I jump into mine? Because I only ask that because I don't know if you were playing this game when it came out. <laughs> I I was already into like RuneScape, WoW, Silk Road, 
Um, and there was even a Digimon MMO around that time, but it was already kind what? of like, <laughs> yeah, it was called um, I think just Digimon World. I think is what it. I think they there. It's still live, but anyways, not to take away from EverQuest, but I uh, I I was aware of it, but I was already entrenched into other MMOs. I think and you know, mm. it's just a matter of one of those things, but. If I knew uh, there was a Digimon yeah. MMO, I would, I, I would, I would never have passed high school. I don't think. I think I would have well, <laughs> still been I, playing. If I'm it. remembering my timeline correctly. The Windows version of EverQuest came out in like n- er, late 1999, or early 2000, hmm. and it that was tracks about uh, right. Yeah, I mean, it was. I think the first time you were really able to do this with 3D graphics, because before you'd had like a lot of the like Ultima, etc. And I've never played EverQuest. My distinct memory of EverQuest is the PC boxes that used to be at Walmart. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I was like, "What is this game?" Because it not only was did it have the display that showed the PC boxes, but then right beside that there were these little gift cards. That you would buy so that you didn't have to use your parents' credit card to pay the monthly fee. Oh, wait. I remember that, and I didn't realize that's what that was for. Yeah, and I remember <laughs> not knowing how to put those two things together in my mind when I first saw them. I was like, wait a minute. Because okay. how old was I in 2000? I was pretty – I was up there, you know. Uh, I'm no Sprite chicken, but um, I had just never seen it before. You know, you'd, you'd – it was like, what are these cards? Why would you have these cards for this game? I didn't understand until someone, until like someone pointed out to me. It's like, oh no, you buy that card, and it refills your monthly subscription on the game. Wow. No. <laughs> and you don't but, need a credit card. Oh. Yeah, and I, I feel like the it's worth calling out that to this day, I know people who play EverQuest. Is it still it going? They have private servers. I mean, oh, and I think yeah. there are people who run servers for EverQuest. Oh, okay. Sorry. Probably... I do forget. There are a lot of those old games people do privately host that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it is still with us in a very big way, I think. Um, yeah. And uh, there are people who swear by and love this game. And I, I can see why. I mean, I just, I feel like I miss the bus on it. Um, but, yeah, my distinct memory is that. It's like... Yeah. That was the first time I ever saw a like prepaid card for a video <laughs> game subscription. And all of these games, RuneScape, Ultima, EverQuest, I mean, they're obviously, all of them are overshadowed by WoW. The just yeah. monolith of a video game. Um, but again, it wasn't, you know, I never played WoW. I never got into that. And again, MMOs, I don't... Uh, you know, I had a brother who's got super into WoW, and I don't know. I just was like, I wasn't really that cool of a kid, but I also saw him playing WoW, and I was like, yeah, what little social life I have, I'm not giving over to this. So I, <laughs> uh, so it's probably not a thing I'll ever get into again. This is probably my only touchstone on touch point on MMOs, but I don't know. It was an important moment. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, moving on, and because I again I'm okay. trying to get get to Jules here, but um, so um, I want to say that I really love and I appreciate Resident Evil, and I really like Resident Evil. Resident Evil Four is you know a classic freaking game. So is the first oh, yeah. two. Um, what I will say. If I have to knock or make fun of Resident Evil, Resident Evil felt slightly like campy horror. It did feel a little like, how do I put this? Um, one hundred percent camp on purpose. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it 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 is scary. There is scary stuff, but it's also kind of campy. Silent Hill Two, yeah, and the whole Silent Hill series is. A hor- was for me the horror the what the reason why I preferred the Silent Hill series to Resident Evil was it was like we're not campy <laughs> we are here to just <laughs> make you feel bad the purpose of this game the more you play it the less fun you'll have you'll feel worse yeah. about yourself 
Um, I, you can't you can't see my screen, but when you, when I saw this and I realized it was Silent Hill Two, I, I I gave you the coffee shop poet snapping fingers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <it's... laughs> um. So, Silent Hill Two. It is a husband who whose wife, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, had a, a grave illness and who recently passed away and enters the town of Silent Hill. Silent Hill, uh, which also, real quick, is vaguely based on the Pennsylvania town of Centralia, which, growing up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, mm. I was a short drive away from. So this also felt like <laughs> like home bo- hometown boy does good. Um, but it is a town that's like more rural than suburban and kind of a town of like oh it's one of those where like you stop at a diner and you're like i don't really i feel like everyone's staring at me i don't feel comfortable here on one end and on the other end it's just actively the portal to hell um yeah is it centrea the one with the mine fire (laughs) yep the mine fire that never went out like in decades that where like seven people still live because they can't kick them out, even though they're like, you're being actively poisoned by and, this mind fire. And real quick, this is totally off topic, but I remember reading about this and the name of the person who founded it, their last name was Faust. Jesus Christ. I do Jonathan miss Pennsylvania Faust. a little bit <laughs> and how dark <laughs> of a freaking state that is. Um, uh, so... Oh, t- he answers. Tell, he, tell, oh, go mm, ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. You go. Well, I was going to say there. Be careful with the spoilers on this one too, because there is a remake of this coming out this year. Yeah. Um, but I'm very curious. Like, there was Silent Hill three. There was Silent Hill one. What is it about Silent Hill two that that puts it on the list for you? I uh, I I enjoyed both three and one. Um, one is absolutely great. That totally fits all that I said before about like, we're going to try to make a serious horror game. Like we're going to make a horror game. That's not, um, necessarily like stylized. Um, Mm -hmm. like I said, I can't, I'm not trying to backhand compliment anything or trying to knock down other horror games. Um, but like a lot of other games like Resident Evil, like Castlevania, they they come from a place of love of classic horror, of classic black and white horror. That feeling like Castlevania was made with love from the Universal Studios monsters. Mm. Like they just wanted to incorporate yeah. and make it feel like that. And Silent Hill 1 uh, was kind of good of like, we aren't necessarily trying to make an homage to like the horror we love. We're trying to make you feel sick to your stomach. <laughs> We're trying to yeah. make you feel bad. And it was psychological horror. Yes. Too, I think. It, yeah. Yes. It is the psychological horror element. Um, reason why I love uh, going off of that specifically, which is why I love Silent Hill two is because it, um, it focused more on the psychological problems the main character was going through. Um, in that, he clearly just went through a massive trauma with his wife dying, how he feels about his wife dying, all these other problems. And he's now entered this world where the game is not being very clear. The game is very purposely making it so you don't know exactly like is this real is this not because you're in this town you're in a character you're a character who's very mentally like in a very mentally weak state there is hints that this town maybe has a cult going on it so maybe there's some dark thing happening you don't know how true that is you don't know how not true it is it is very all of these elements are there to make you question what you're experiencing. It's Mm. there to get into the head of the main character. It all like pyramid head is, you know, it's not really spoiler. And again, I don't really, (laughs) 
<laughs> Pyramid Head, the main, he's not actually the main villain. Um, he's just the biggest problem <laughs> that you have to deal with, but he's not like the big bad guy. Sorry. Oh, I'm really trying not to do any spoilers. Um, but uh, he is a representation sub. This game had subtext, which is what I really loved. Yeah. It had the subtext of Pyramid had represented what the main character was experiencing in his mind. And it basically was mm. like, hey, you know, all that depression and trauma and selfishness and like sexual frustration you were feeling. What if that was a big, beefy monster with a sword who was trying to stab you? <laughs> <laughs> like, and that's what it was. There's a point in the game where Pyramid Head. Uh, you come across because Pyramid Head, who's this kind of he like comes in out and he's this sort of big bad guy. There's a point where you like come across him and he's killing the other monsters like like the other monsters that like have been trying to come for you. You see he, like he's there and he's like assaulting uh, like something that was a mini boss for you before. And you're just kind of like, oh, he's not like on their team. He's just he's he's just his own horrible force of nature mm -hmm. that is there just to destroy and uh it, it, it honestly it is one of the scariest things not that he's trying to kill you but that he's like yeah i kill out anything i'm i'm just i'm just yeah. a force that you have to deal with in your life <laughs> awesome I selection say, i um i recall my brother and his friend playing this game on like a projector that we had set up and i do remember having nightmares i don't remember exactly i think it was just the liminal horror of like the early game of just you know it's really foggy dark and there's sounds um but i do remember having nightmares just because i was watching them play <sighs> I, I do want to play like a full silent hill game though at some point <laughs> Just and really like there's years. little going off of that there's like the liminalness is actually what really is haunting because there's there like again in other games where it's like this is scary because there's a lot of big scary things they're all coming at you and sometimes you're like i don't know you'll enter a room and like there's a monster there he's not really that into you but he's there and you're like that's more unsettling that now i don't know if i should always be on guard or there's one time you just walk down a hallway and I was actually playing with my roommate and like you're walking down a long hallway and you hear your own footsteps and you just hear like clack, 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 clack. And like me and my roommates were like, wait, why is there like four steps for every time we take a step? And like we had a moment where like we like, OK, just stop moving your character. And we just like stopped and we then heard like a pause and it was like clack, clack. Clack, clack. And then we turned around and Pyramid Head was like slow walking at us. It was like, yeah, oh my God. And it was just like one of those perfect movie moments of just like, oh God, <laughs> he's not even running after us. He's just like slowly ambling at us. And that's so much scarier. <laughs> yeah, this, you know, it's funny because for some reason when you were talking about that, it reminded me of um, an of like dead ringer and those kind of psychological horror movies where you're like the slowness, the pacing, it just creates this uncomfortableness where you're like, I don't even want to be in my own skin anymore. Yeah. Like this world is so upsetting and so devoid of what the world is that it now scares me. Um. And like, you know, at the very <laughs> If you want to be totally tacky about it, you can be like, oh, this is very hot topic. People being edgy for edgy's sake. But what I really appreciated about the Silence Hill series is people truly trying to express mental unwellness in a video game in a way where you are, you are experiencing the depression and the anger and the frustration of the character because the character that you're playing is suffering from trauma and this yeah. video game is an artistic representation of the trauma and his ability to overcome trauma and it's what i really appreciate it that's why i think it's you know it kind of gets held up as one of those artistic sort of you know, things that people come back to in video gaming. Um, anyway, that's why I really like it. Awesome selection. Cool. And, okay, moving on to a much more horrible 
gut wrenching, more rated X game, um, Super Mario World. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will wrap this up very quickly. True horror. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, technically, it would be really horror if you're just like, I'm in this weird world of <laughs> of monster dinosaurs and turtles. Like, technically, yes, this would be a very terrible freaking game um <laughs> as depicted anyway. in the 80s movie right or <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah the, like which is still technically one you know it, uh it, it is a cyberpunk movie the the mario yeah. brothers movie um okay so, so i really struggled with uh picking this game mario 64 mario 3 mario 1 even Mario RPG just got barely bumped off this list. Um, the reason I picked this one is because, for me, this was the moment as a kid where I got a Super Nintendo and I got a video game. And this was my experience of just being a child and just having that feeling of turning on a game and just just being a happy child <laughs> it what i love about the mario series and you know we say anything you will about nintendo there was just this feeling of just completion of just this is a world of adventure of fun there's like it is going to change like in ways you're not going to spe- expect as you play it and just feeling like this just complete beautiful storybook adventure as as a third grader and that's why i think this is this is my pick awesome so was this the game that came with your super nintendo was this the first super nintendo game you owned and was the super nintendo the first system you owned yes like you personally not your brothers but you personally Yes, yes, it was because mm. this, as I said before, I don't know who bought us a Super Nintendo because, again, it was probably against the wishes of my mom of just like, ah, crap, <laughs> I don't want these kids playing. Who bought them this? Um, but at some point, we got for Christmas a Super Nintendo and this came with it. And like, I remember having Christmas at my grandparents and us not even waiting to go home until we plugged that in and started playing it. I remember playing this at my grandparents of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we're only here for a couple hours, but we got to start shit testing this thing out. Um, Super Mario three, I will say is here's what I'll say. Uh, the reason I struggled between Super Mario three and Super Mario world, Super Mario three actually replayed as an adult. And I actually really appreciated, um, that game is very well designed. It is designed in the sense of I never really respected how good the level design is in Super Mario 3 in the sense of I realized as I was playing it, it's almost made to be speed run before speed running was even a thing where I realized like, mm. oh, if I jump on this Goomba, I'm going to land on this platform, which instantly sets me up to actually just jump on this person and this. And technically they really thought out like, hey, you could beat all of these levels in 20 seconds if you knew where to hop, skip and jump. And there was, I don't know, it felt like if you really knew how to play Super Mario 3, like you could just bounce through that. You could feel like you're Neo in the Matrix. Super Mario World didn't have that level of level design, but what I loved about it was it just felt like such a bigger world. It felt like you were traversing a bigger world of different lands and colors, and it just felt the world felt larger. And so that was why I picked this one. Awesome choice. Yeah, I, I will say for me, like I think it's still maybe the best Super Mario game out there. Mm-hmm. Um and and I and I love Super Mario three. I even love Super Mario like Super Mario two, which you know didn't originally start off as a Mario oh, yes. game. But yeah, I think Super Mario World, the controls, the color scheme, and as you put it, it's you know like Mario. A lot of the Mario games are theatrical productions, right? Yeah. Like, 
you're, you're, it, they hint heavily that none of the things that are actually happening in the play or in the game are real. You're like, you're a character in a play and you're doing, you know, you're on the adventure for the audience's enjoyment. And um, the, the scale of the sets in Super Mario World, unbelievable. Yeah, kind of going off what uh, Thoth has said in sort of my chat where he says Super Mario 3 in some ways feels more advanced and certainly more tightly designed than Super Mario World. And I'd say, yeah, that's 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 kind of what I was trying to express is Super Mario 3 is great because it is a very tight game. It feels like every element they put into it feels purposeful and leads up to something. And Super Mario World feels very epic and expansive is why I love it. Awesome. All right. I'm going to take me. us to the next one. Thank you. I Thank am you so, so sorry. I read so long with that. No, I, I did too. I, no, you know, I, I, not at all. This is great. <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Mario world because I mean, that was a contender for me and I even considered like super Mario advance or even paper Mario, but glad that we were able to touch on, you know, some of the OGs. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I'm going well, to click over if y'all are ready. Okay. You're up. Sure thing. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Ah, oh. sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm just nice. seeing things. Oh, I'm like, sure. oh, glad we got some reactions here. No, I'm just There's like some of these I don't know, but some of them I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, <laughs> now that we fully revealed them all, can I say that first off, it's very impressive that none of us had any overlap. But seeing both of yours, I've had moments of like, oh, how did I not even think of that? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. See, that's how I felt about your guys's too. Yeah. <laughs> um, before this call, I had three honorable mentions, but uh, the last minute, I just removed them because I wanted to stay true to the nine. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. So it was yeah, such a difficult thing. So I'll just um, I'll keep pace then with kind of going through these, but uh, pretty much my go-to has always been Legend of Zelda: Wind Waker. The 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 just the expansiveness, the the level of player agency that you're given with open world traversal via a boat. You know, you've got this granular ocean, the soundtrack, everything's tied together. It's there's just so many things, uh, and I can't wait for the remake on the Switch, if and when it gets announced. <laughs> it will, I believe it will. But um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's funny we both have Zelda as kind of our top one, Jay. Um, yeah, it's and and you know this was the this was the other one that I would have put if I hadn't put the one I put. Yeah, um, even over Ocarina of Time, I think that you know were you like was this game released when you were a kid? Like you saw the other envisionings of this game that people had thought it was going to be mm. before it went to sell. Oh trading. yes, I actually remember that. Yeah, like the art, they, I mean, the art is, yeah, it's it's close to the game art, right? Um, I mean, I played Legend of Zelda games before this one. It wasn't, like, my first, but it was definitely, like, my favorite. Um, I think the art style is the main inspiration for my current art style as a 3D artist. So, like, I do draw from, like, yeah, self-shaded rendering, like, stroking, uh, desaturated, vibrant color palettes, which are kind of a mix of executing like getting things certainly right to like get a certain feel um yeah i don't know it's just so adventurous you know uh yeah it's, it's, see i think about wind waker a lot if exactly. uh if if i uh, to go off what uh jo camp i think was referencing if i remember correctly the original um trailer or teaser for this sort of game when they were coming out with it if i remember was a hyper realistic zelda and that was the first time they were coming out with like okay this next game is going to be zelda but as realistic and gritty as possible and i remember there being a weird backlash when they finally like went the other direction were like actually it's a very cell shaded cartoony sort of stylized version and people were initially very kind of squawking at that because they're like oh we we didn't get the realistic zelda that we were promised um but going off what you're saying i love the art style in this game it's yeah. beautiful yeah. and i love that they went this direction yeah oh yeah it's inspired so many other like 
I mean, I, we have someone in the chat too, like thoughts that you're saying, you know, there's kind of an influence there, which, um, yeah, it's true. I mean, even with many of these games, like there's kind of a bold statement moments where, um, you know, the, that can occur at, sorry, the last four words sometimes even. Um, cool. Yeah. So, uh, I, I even have like posters and stuff in my room. It's, it's always my go-to, um, I could go on. Um, Early my next one is, follow. I've, uh, um, be- oh, go ahead, before Jay. you move on to this game though, I mean, this game, Yeah. I don't want you to feel rushed. I mean, this game is, uh, you know, I think from, from a, from a, this is going to be controversial again, I think. This is my favorite 3D Zelda. And I don't think you get the games. I, I'm not a, like, I haven't really gotten into the newer, like, Tears of the Kingdom, etc. I I get they're amazing. I just haven't had a chance to really get into them. But um, I don't think those exist. And even, you know, any of the other games without how masterful Wind Waker was. And the music, the art style... The, the scope of the game in terms of like the ocean exploration, everything about this game was breathtaking, I think, at the time it came out. And did you play it on the GameCube when you first played it? I did. Yep. Yep. Wow. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to double down on what uh, J.O. Camp's saying. I I really struggled if I was going to put a Zelda game or not on my list. And if one was going to go on, it was going to be Wind Waker. <laughs> I, I think of the created, I mean, yeah, that, I would say composition is the best thing because I had a balance of everything you had. Like when you, when you're going after a mini boss, like the first mini boss that you verse it's, there's a soundtrack just for that specific situation. Oh yeah. Yeah. And like just the world building around the Koroks and now those are also in the newer games. So like, yeah, definitely they, they went big with that. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. So uh, it just, you know, again, kind of, when we started this, I um, I talked a little bit about like, all right, what are the ones that I've technically played the most and do they deserve a slot? And I think they do. Uh, <laughs> Marvel versus Capcom 2. Uh, definitely just, I wish there was a more accessible way I could play this because, man, I just, such a great game. get a Dreamcast. <laughs> yeah, Dreamcast, or try and emulate some built arcade I can do. or Build a time machine, go back to 2003. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you know, I was, I was thinking about getting just a, an older Xbox just to run it, because um, that's what I used to play it on. Um, but yeah, just the amount of characters and the variety, like, I just felt like that was also uh, another really kind of way that opened my, like, I guess my mind up to, like, just, like, the possibilities of, like, what happens when you give players access to all the options up front? Well, I guess you have to slowly unlock them, but like, I just think it's important sometimes with certain games to like give people options. And of course, like the, this game is built on mixing and matching the best team of three you can do. But uh, I just thought it was fitting because it's a it's a three team game on a three three person stream. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe we can find a way to play it or one of its successors you know and like uh i will say that like it, this is building off of that um king of fighters kind of uh you know there was the king of fighters by snk and then there was there was capcom versus snk and then there was marvel versus capcom and i think that marvel versus capcom kind of perfected the balance i think in that you know yeah marvel's capcom 2 was I would say the last of its uh, like the the best last of its uh, franchise, uh, you know, MVC three and Ultimate and all the others. I just felt like they didn't really hit the same mark because they went yeah. to Street Fighter, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like you've got superpowers, you've got ultimate moves. Like those are things you don't see in other fighter games, but they're it's not you know they're intended to be balanced against each other, which I felt like they did pretty well. So yeah, I'll make a fighter game. I'll um, also say that right now, obviously, we're 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 kind of burnt out on endless superhero movies and shared universes and and all that sort of stuff. At this time when this came out, this was uh, this was drugs to a child. This was <laughs> th- like I am seeing all of the people I love, all of my heroes, and they're fighting all of my other heroes. This is the coolest yeah. thing I've ever seen. 
<laughs> yeah, it was the big crossover event. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, I mean, another, I'll just skip over it just a little bit with Super Smash Bros. Melee. Like, the, these two have a lot in common because, and the reason I put them there uh, on this list, too, is because those inspired me to go out to other games. And I, I think mm-hmm. Nintendo intentionally made conglomerate games like Super Smash Bros. Um, and I think Marvel vs. Capcom 2 did this as well where it's basically like, here's all of our IP. Let's give this to our players and like see what they like and see what they bite on. Like, I didn't know who Jill was until I played MVC2. And mm. that was like, oh, Resident Evil. What's Resident Evil? And I start going into that. And then it's like, okay, and then Resident Evil 4 and so on. And same with Super Smash Bros. Like, that's the reason I... Like, the whole trophy gallery, like, you got to see all yeah. these 3D models of, like, hundreds of Nintendo IP... Like, oh, what's Paper Mario? Okay, now I'm going to play Thousand Year Door. And, like, yeah, just it, it got me into, like, so many other things, like Kirby's Air Ride. And so that's, like, it's almost like those two, Melee and MVC2, are almost, like, pivot points for this list. They're, like, because, gateways, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're the goats, I think. I don't know. They had to be there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, going off what you said with uh, Marvel versus Capcom, that was actually probably my introduction, I think, to a lot of marvel universe like it is the thing where like i just knew like ah, i know who hulk is i know who spider-man is i don't know all these other people who are they so i think it it was kind of like a little bit of an introduction to a deeper nerdier world Mm -hmm. yeah it makes me think of like what other conglomerates can do that well um i mean like obviously the game has to be balanced like we have um multiverses which is like uh, Warner Bros. kind of attempting to do that. Um, I think there's another one, right? Um, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Um, and I feel like it does need to be in the competitive world, but um, I'm curious to see if there's going to be another one of these that comes out in the next decade. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they can pull it off. And, and I mean, just thinking about some of the characters like Blackheart and BB mm. BB Hood, and oh Am- yeah, Am- Amingo, you know, like yeah, what a great game. Yeah. Also, awesome like and, and like they could have not like. I really appreciate when they, you know, they're using all these IPs for the game and they could have maybe just rested on the fact of like, oh, yeah, you you kids love these characters, whatever, we can half-ass it. But the art, like, the going back to what we are saying, like, the art's really good in this game. Like, oh, the yeah. pixel the art's so good. The animation is so smooth. Like, they really brought out their A-game with the art direction in this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I almost wonder if it affected my attention span with gaming. Um, because, <laughs> like, you give me 50-plus characters on both of the... I mean, I guess uh, Smash Bros. Melee was, like, 24, and now Ultimate has, like, 60-plus, right? Yeah. Um, it, it makes me think about, if I'm going to play a fighter game, first tell me how many characters can I select from. If it's less than eight, then I might not be interested. And that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, like, 54 in this game. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't know if you guys know about like the Mugen or Mugen kind of. Oh, I know. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You got like thousand characters. Yeah. <laughs> built. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I'm it's so affected. curious about this next game on your list. Yeah, oh, I've never God. heard of this. I have this. no idea what it is. Yeah, this it's is. Weird. I totally don't oh, know God. this. This is space Minecraft for like adults. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a great elevator pitch. I've put like thirty six hundred hours into this game. I've oh. I haven't played it in a while, but um, yeah, it's just a crafting game in space with physics and planet travel, and they've spent years perfecting it. It's not like it's not like totally um, what's the word like uh, subpar. It's like pretty well polished and like it is kind of high level like you have to like spend time to like learn how to play the game which is kind of a barrier for a lot of people but earlier in the stream we were talking about jank being a mechanic and actually Mm -hmm. um because it's physics a physics based game you have space like empty space gravity and then you've got planetary gravity so if you're building spaceships they have to be able to live in space or live on in atmospheres 
anyways, you can think from a coding perspective, that's kind of a, a nightmare a recipe for disaster, um, <laughs> which it is. So there's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's uh, a, in the, in the gaming community with space engineers, there's uh, some lore and the lore is that whenever the physics engine breaks, um, the jink, you know, happens, right. Uh, they call that uh, Klang or yeah, like K L A N G Klang. And that mm -hmm. is like the, this god, this cosmic god of physics that has entered your game and broken it. So it's celebrated <laughs> when the jank happens because it means that you've pushed the game to the limits. Oh, nice. You've done something, <laughs> so you've done something as a game supposed... developer, is that just like a clever way to get around the reality of those kind of physics? In the yeah, game engine? yeah. I mean, the developers themselves, they've embraced like the fact that they can't oh, always... Oh, I can't hear you for some reason. I'm going to have oh. a fix something. Oh. Sorry. I can now. still hear you. I don't know. Okay. You all go on without me. I can't hear you at the moment. Uh oh. Okay. Regardless, uh, yeah, the uh, the developers pretty much embraced that idea of like, yeah. all right, physics can break, but let's let the community come up with the reasoning and let's just like lean into it and you know, not take our, ourselves too seriously. So like, yeah, it's a crafting game, survival game. You can like do all it's do all sorts of stuff. It's just great. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's. It still has a pretty dedicated community, and like you've got servers that run. So, um, but it kind of runs that survival server format. So, so how many years ago did you uh, start getting into it? How old uh, is this game? <laughs> I think it came out in two thousand eight. I think I started. Okay, playing it so fairly, fairly decently old at this point. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, I don't quite remember, but yeah, it's, I played it around 2011. Yeah. Oh, it came out in 2013, so it must have been around 2013. Oh wow! I started playing okay, it. Yeah. so actually, so you know what's very what's interesting about that? I, I, I uh, someone checked me, but like when Minecraft and all that other stuff went mm -hmm. out, but like I feel like that's fairly like it's kind of early on the wave of like mm -hmm. crafting, survival, all that sort of stuff, which now is like. That nowadays like games are just yeah, like ham-fistedly like, forcing that into every game just because like oh this is popular this seems like it's kind of ahead of the curve oh yeah like they i think their biggest gimmick was the fact that they like had these like computer systems you could build into your ships so like they could be like automated and like yeah the logic behind everything you're doing is like intentional and um and i think you know minecraft definitely definitely started all of that um, but I feel like that was kind of their leading force. Yeah. To, like, build on yeah. I think Minecraft was around 2000, 2009 and then gained like a lot of popularity by 2011 or maybe it was out in 2011 and the original release, like the Java version was in 2009. Mm -hmm. So this would have right. been like only two years after. It yeah. Really super started. early on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, uh, I'll move on to the next one here. Um, so, when it comes to like RPGs, I feel like Fire Emblem was the first time I was introduced to like Risk, um, mm. and it really hit me hard when like my first character died because in Fire Emblem, for those that aren't familiar, uh, oftentimes not so much in the newer games you can turn the setting off, but you are going through a storyline and your cast of characters, you know, you're you're building your cast of characters and you can have them join your team and select which ones you want to use in battles and stuff but when they die they, they're they gone for good for the save so wow. yeah it's like you really want them to survive and there's even specific situations where if one of them dies it's the only way to unlock like a different character so like you've got like heavy heavy sacrifice and of course the narrative here is like you've got different continents that are at war and there's a conflict and you've got humanity that kind of is entrenched in this conflict and so, yeah, just Fire Emblem is just like one of those hard-hitting games that Sacred Stones was the one I played the most, and um, just very iconic. Um, so, is this a GBA Fire game? Emblem. Did you play this on GBA? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Oh, awesome. So, as someone who mostly knows Fire Emblem characters through the Super Smash Brothers series, yeah. um, <laughs> is is the fire is this game closer to? say the traditional final fantasy games or is it closer to final fantasy tactics mm, closer to tactics yep. okay mm. yeah yeah so it's the type of strategy um where you've kind of got a battlefield you're planning your spots and then you're sending them each turn 
and they go into these little like fight sequences. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's funny too. Cause like, all right, again, super smash bros. I was like, all right, who's Marth and who's Roy. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, what's the quickest way I can play a fire emblem game. And the one I got was sacred stones. And even though these weren't the characters that I'd seen before, I got just enthralled by the story and like these, the characters design too is very like, um, almost like, I mean, it's, it's pretty on par with like that, like anime style game narrative, but yeah, like the Fire Emblem aesthetic is very inspired by European, um, like medieval, um, I guess, fashion wear. And like, there's, yeah. there's a mix of that utility. So it really speaks volumes to, I think each design. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Super, super Good cool. Choice. Uh, I, yeah. I like, uh, I've seen Fire Emblem stuff around, but I've never played one, so I'm gonna have to mm. add it to my list. Same, oh, yeah. Yeah. same here. That was that was one I've I wanted to play, and I I did not get a hold of. Again, being introduced through like you know Smash Bros. and you know I I knew of a lot of the main tier JRPG ish, and it's ilk. Um, but I yeah, I always wanted to play this one. I have to. I mm. should dive in. That makes it sound very cool. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. For sure. Um. And even like Erica, one of the, like the the main leads, she's just such an inspiration as a personality. And like, yeah. when you, I feel like when you allow yourself with JRPG, like, I think that people don't understand is like they're very story driven, obviously, but you really have to like uh, buy into that story. And once you do, it's like the payoff is just so well worth it. Um, kind of like just I, I've got every game. single G like a version of every single Game Boy ever made. Um, and I've never played a Fire Emblem game, so if I can find Fire Emblem the Sacred Stone for a good price, I'm going to pick it up. Uh, I, I very quickly, both of you, I have to be right back, but go ahead and keep on. I'll be I'll be back in just oh, a sure. second. Sure thing. So uh, I'll be I'll just kind of keep up or maybe pick up the pace too. Um, so with uh, Sonic Adventure Two, uh, I think the main thing I'll say with this is that the Chow Gardens were the the backbone. <laughs> this is what they carried that <laughs> game. <laughs> Okay, so here's what I will ask you: of all of the Sonic games, why this one? Chow Gardens. Chow Gardens. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the first adventure had Chow Gardens. It had like the special ones that you had, like Egg Island, Eggplant Island, or, or uh-huh. sorry, Eggman Island. Um, and even though Adventure Two had different, you know, Chow Gardens, but um. Yeah, anytime there's a new Sonic game in the past decade, my question is, does it have a Chow Garden, though? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a, It's not going to be a good Sonic game. A <laughs> <laughs> but I know that there's other good ones out there, but do you like any other Sonic? I, um, well, I, you know what? I, I played the early Sonic games. Like, I actually, I remember having a Sega Genesis at some point, like one of my older, older brothers, acquired one and like when he got too old for it he gave me his copy of sonic um that i got i i have not kept up with the sonic Mm. games like i know this is a huge world this is a huge series that i have not explored at all um so i i'm actually weirdly in the dark about this (laughs) I've maybe seen the Sonic cartoons more than I've seen, like the actual games. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There were some badass games. Sonic oh, cartoons, yeah. by the way. <laughs> such a good. Oh man, such a good series. Yeah, so mature too. Like, ah, loved it. You might have answered this while I was gone, but mm-hmm. what what was it about Sonic Adventure Two? Was this mm-hmm. like? Did you was your introduction to Sonic on like the Dreamcast, or had you played Sonic mm-hmm. on the? Genesis, etc. Um, see, my introduction was, yeah, it was just watching my friend play Sonic Adventure One, and then we both bought Sonic Adventure Two and just traded the hell out of Chow Garden stuff, like items, eggs, and I, while you were gone, I just mentioned like that was the only reason I, I played the game was because of the Chow Gardens, and any Sonic game in the future. Uh, requires a chow garden for me to feel like it's <laughs> worth getting it's Sonic game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the universe is just great. I mean, you've got like these, you know, anamorphic characters and the community is built around like connecting with these characters, creating their own characters. You've got a lot of um, people creating like original personas around 
um, characters that they've made in this universe. So like, I just feel like it's so it's cast a wide net uh, among different yeah. kind of communities. Um, so I think this is probably like the first most influential game I ever played was Heroes of Might and Magic 3. Uh, strategy game, high fantasy, specific art style. The best of all the Heroes of Might and Magic, debatably, is 3. Um, there's also a pretty dedicated community to this game. They still make mods, but it's just like really well done in terms of like the art style and like, again, the range of selection. I think is probably what was one of the first reasons I, I came to it. But um, yeah, me and my best friend at the time, we just played it, played it so much. And um, can I actually yeah, yeah. Uh, make a comment on what I'm noticing of, of stuff that you've picked um, with Fire Emblem and with the fact that you're maybe touchstones with Final Fantasy or Final Fantasy Tactics. Um, I, I find it really interesting that... Uh, cause I love heroes of might and magic and it's a very specific type of, um, strategy game. It is like, it's not Starcraft. It's not that it's a little slightly more, I don't know, technical moving pieces around a board kind of game. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's like that's elevated chess. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, and, you know, I struggled because I wanted to put, like, RTS games. Like, I played a lot of Age of Empires, but I felt mm. like this one gave more justice to myself of just, like, still play this today. Like, yeah. I could spend hours <laughs> uh, playing this game as well. And there, it's inspired some indie games as well. So, like, um, yeah, there's there's a lot to it. Um, I've never played this one, but I'm looking at it right now, and it... it like I I had heard of the Heroes of Might and Magic series, obviously. I'd seen a lot of their like first person dungeon crawler more more games. Mm -hmm. Um and this looks very different. The graphics look like they're 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 still awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like it's still it still holds up in a very like it's a product of its time, but yeah, this looks yeah. fantastic. And it looks like there's an H D edition mm -hmm. that you can still buy. Yep, yeah, it's uh, it's on Steam. Um, the complete edition is better because it has more features, but the HD edition is still good. Yeah, but um, the there's an editor that comes with the game where you can create your own maps. And, oh my um, god, yeah. You know, just create your own stories, your own narratives, and like that was also pretty huge because you had access to like terrain building, and of course you can do that in other RTSs, but like this is more turn based. Um, but you're basically you can craft an entire like scenario and. Um, tell your own story in a way, um, which I think is good with a lot of different. Mostly, I think the only games that really do that here is like Heroes, Space Engineers, and Gigantic are the ones that aren't as narrative driven for the players. Um, it's like, you know, there's the games where like the story is given to you, and then there's the games where you have to tell your own story, where if it's a competitive game, the story being told there is like, oh, you know, I, there was a time that me and my friends like, connected like we we came in clutch and like that's the story it's like mm -hmm. the moment the moments that you create you know um, yeah and, and kind of yeah. going off what uh Thos has said is that uh the, you know these types of games are a little bit more uh deliberate than like or deliberative than than most real-time strategy games where i i had a friend back in high school i think it was Oh man, I'm trying to remember if it was Warcraft three or Starcraft two. I don't. I, I one of those Blizzard type games, um, top down strategy games, and mm -hmm. watch it. And he actually was kind of like good enough to start getting like ranked in competitions. And it, it, watching him was interesting with those type of games because it kind of feels like. It's like watching someone use hotkeys really well in a F Adobe Photoshop, where it's just kind of like. It's watching so like there's obviously tons of strategy, but it's sort of this like very like I I don't know it's very quick and fast and actiony and and with the hero series, which is also funny that like I would have never thought of to put this on my list, but mm. going off sort of what you and Thoth have said is like I dunked tons of hours into this series. It is right. yeah, and it's a lot more. It's like you said, it's a lot more like 
he's playing chess. It's a lot more like playing a board game, but yeah. like a little more intense than that. I don't know. It's it's a yeah, great yeah. series. Yeah, I think too, because like if you play this on like full screen on like a 4K screen, you've got like full stimulation going with all the different colors and elements to click on. Like, yeah, you know, connect with it. Um, yeah, so this next game is gigantic. It was an indie game around 2014, I think, to 2016, 17. It only lasted for a certain while, but now it's getting rebooted as of this month, I think in 14 yeah. days from now, um, somewhere around there. Um, it's a MOBA, three third-person shooter MOBA. Um, you've got like a cast of characters, uh, growing casts, uh, over eight, I will say, which is good. Um, but the uh, the the main premise is that you've got two teams on each side, and they are clashing over domain over a certain battlefield, and there's different battlefields. Um, but you've got these titans on each team, these gigantic titans, and they're in the background at war. And in the world, you've got these two factions that are at war at all times, and there's a few other pa- factions at play. But during each game, these titans are battling. And the context of your match, which I think was important, um, was that like each team represents this titan. And so as they turn the tide of battle and as they win, their titan also turns the tide of battle. Um, so you're not really interacting with these titans at all, but you see them interacting in the background at all times. So, you know, if you make progression, like in League, you know, you're you're progressing to almost enemy lines, you've taken down all their towers. Um, you know, it's printed, printed like 75% of the way through. Um, you see that carry out in the environment as you're playing it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like really fleshed out, well well done game, um, built on Unreal Engine. So, you know, it's just like really clean, high quality, yeah. dedicated player base has brought it back from, from the dead, literally. The art style is amazing. Yeah, it looks really cool. Like it, it came out in 2017. Oh, 17. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So it must have gone offline like only two years or so after it launched. It, yes. Do you know why it, it didn't short. like, why didn't it take off? Like what happened that it, it, it mm. had to have this like fan revival? I'm not too sure. I mean, I think uh, it might've been like a funding thing. Um, I think, I can't remember who owned it for a while, but they were holding on to the IP for a while. Mm. Um, and then over the years, I guess, yeah, man, has it only been since 2017? I don't know, it seems like forever ago. But um, yeah, the player base started doing private servers, the mods, and their Discord was like in the thousands. And eventually the original developers noticed that and they were like, oh my gosh, like our players are still, they still care about the game, we should reboot it. And I don't know what they, what strings they had to pull to do that, but now it's it's coming out again, so... Yeah, um, I'm looking cool. at the like the quick Wikipedia article for this game, and it's like it's wild because it the beta came out in 2015, it fully released in 2017, and then it was discontinued in 2018. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I definitely it played had the beta a, quite a bit. But it looks like it just looks. I mean, the graphics, the the art style on this just immediately when you you had mentioned this game to me in a different conversation. And I was just immediately struck by the graphics and like the not not the graphs the graphics the design, like yeah. The way that the art style and the world and the game mechanics combined, it it just feels perfect in a way. So it was it was really surprising to hear that it didn't it didn't take off the first time around. Well, going off a little bit about what you said before about the art design of Wind Waker, this really feels like Mm. if Wind Waker's art design wasn't quite a one-off, it, this feels like it took it. This is gorgeous. These, this is a really gorgeous art design that I really love. And Mm. it feels very Wind Waker-y as if like Wind Waker got years to develop and and focus on that style it it did Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah totally i i can definitely see that like you've got that that soft modeled edge to to a lot of the elements and intentional character design where you know you've got the factor that's communicating what they're what each character does and you've got your staple robotic mech character and your your staple support and like dps characters but they they expand away from that eventually and um yeah, no, it's just it's just a really good game, you know, and glad it's coming back. And it's just, I, 
my friends in college we used to play it all the time so it's just like has a special wow. spot on my list i'm gonna pitch that i think we should definitely do this one on stream together. yeah this looks okay. really cool okay let's so get, tell me again what is it. coming back in 14 days or whatever you said are they like bringing it back or what's yes. okay so it's called it's called gigantic rampage edition um it's just the reboots on steam which okay is- and this is an official not a fan thing this is like from the company yes yep cool yep. okay okay i'm very down yeah, no, you know, check it out. And you know, I, I don't know if you're into like a lot of competitive, but it's like, it's it's I would say an accessible like MOBA, um, but it's yeah. not top down. You know, it's like action three third person. So like, I don't know. It, it yeah, if you're into that type of pace of game, like it's pretty um pretty fun. So yeah, I'd love to play with awesome. you guys. That'd be great. Yeah, let's <laughs> you, do it. yeah please and, wreck and, us, and, to destroy us <laughs> as we learn how to play this game. <laughs> Well, I'll carry and it. I think I think the next game is another one where I'd like to collab on with you all at some point because I've heard so much about this and I've never played it. Yeah, I don't know this one. Oh no, yeah, for sure. So you know, there's a lot of twos and threes in our lists, and the thing is, is that you know, it's it's one thing to like make a good game, right? It's another thing to iterate on it, like mm-hmm. MBT two, Sonic Adventure two, Risk of Rain mm-hmm. two. Like these are reason. These are like all IP that have like. All right, we know there's we know that there's some gold here. Let's like let's grow that, you know, let's make something more like let's scale it up, like lean in. And even on some of your guys' lists, like you notice like when you know, when you're just building on something that's already there that you know is successful and then just like getting it right, nail in the coffin. <laughs> so yeah. like uh that's pretty much the risk of Rainus. Uh it's um it's a game that punishes you constantly um and risk of rune one and two are same type of game in terms of the format of like gameplay loop but risk of rain two is just like a 3d version of risk of rain one so that's why i say two is just an elevated version of it but you're you're a survivor on a distant planet um and you need to kill a boss at like on each level and there's like 10 levels and you can keep going after 10 to 20 to 100 if you can survive long enough. But mm-hmm. every every time you complete a level, the the enemies get harder, the bosses get harder. But so do you. You earn items and you get upgrades for your character. It's uh, it's a it's a roguelike. So every time you do a run, you just kind of reset what you're doing. Yeah. Um, you're getting, and you can like stack. the The big thing with Risk of Rain is the stacks. So like. I get if I get an item that improves my uh, my output of how many bullets I fire uh, every second, um, you know, let's say that's doubled. I get another one that's quadrupled. I get another one that's like you know tripled, right? Or quad, you know, and then on. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you can really yeah. just. And is it a game. game like? Is it is it typically from my understanding? Risk of Rain is very like you have to understand the power ups to really do well in it. You do, and they like, try. I feel like they try and do a good job of like explaining it, but there's so much happening all at once. Like you probably miss what you just picked up. But <laughs> yeah, it's all about. You know what? It. I'm looking awesome. at this, and it uh, maybe tell me if I'm right or wrong. It feels very modern and very contemporary, but it feels like spiritually kind of like a classic arcade game. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Like if this was built into an arcade machine, like man, that would be like. <laughs> one of the most popular games. <laughs> like, like, but yeah, absolutely. It's definitely arcade. Like it's a roguelike where, you know, you've, you've got to run, you do a run and you finish it. And, you know, you can still take things like, like if you win a round, you'll probably unlock some stuff to show up, you know, in future runs. But um, yeah, there's, and there's like world behind it. Like there's lore, like on this distant planet and you've got characters that, um kind of relate to each other in in specific ways so yeah there's definitely a a streamable game as well (laughs) awesome let's play it on stream soon and and i don't want to like go over because i talked about how great gigantic's art style was but this also seems like it's got a really cool art style (laughs) yeah yeah and i think the original risk of rain i never played it but i always saw like the I always saw the images of it, and it always was captivating. I mean, it's just such a unique art style, and the world seems 
kind of dystopian and dark and challenging. So the art director did a fantastic job with it. It's like, mm-hmm. it has such a unique calling card. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And then like Oops. iconic soundtrack. Absolutely. Um, Sorry. Yeah. It, it, no, no, you're fine. Yeah. It's, and you know, it's like the same thing of like, not only the bosses, but they like, they multiply, like everything multiplies. And so like, you kind of, feel that within the music so like when there's more enemies there's like more intense music and it's built on yeah built on everything Ooh, i always awesome. appreciate that yeah i think this uh, is a sooner than later stream we got yeah this also yeah you're monster. you're you're like because that was i think was the thing of like well you know I, I have stuff i really like but i'm not going to introduce anyone to anything new i feel like the stuff you brought out i'm like oh hell i really want to play that game now yeah <laughs> for sure um yeah, so anyways, I'll, I'll end it on a short note. I mean, Smash Bros, it's... it's Never new, heard of it. The Nintendo Go, <laughs> it's got... Yeah, what? Smash Bros? What? Wait, I yeah. Mean, I, I, put, <laughs> I put Melee in there only because of, like... I, I'm not, like, a purist. Like, I love Ultimate. But, um, you know, Melee had a little bit more of an accessible nature to the, like... Yeah, I mentioned earlier, just branching into other IP. I feel like there's a little bit of a barrier there with Ultimate. But, like... Um, you know, and then there's like mods for melee that have perfected the engine, but like, yeah, all around, it's, it's yeah, timeless. I mean, oh, yeah, I didn't even realize melee, there was like, a, a Smash Brothers modding community. Yep, Project Project M is what it's called for. Yeah, yeah, oh. Smash they get in a lot of trouble with Nintendo because Nintendo's so litigious. But uh, <laughs> the thing for me with Super Mario Brothers Melee is the controller on the GameCube was just. That that particular one was just so perfect, yeah. um, and I really think you need the pro controller or a different controller for Melee uh, Ultimate because the, the Nintendo Switch, as great as it is, the controllers are not very good. But um, yeah, which is I think why Melee was the first time I really became aware of Super Smash Brothers, even though it had come out on the sixty four. Honestly, I I really think that Smash Brothers, the original and Melee, really showcased the great design work of the hardware that nintendo would create because man i whipped those controllers off my friends heads because they were cheating um and <laughs> they never broke <laughs> they... yep yep well yeah, a, lot of, a lot of rage quits yep 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 um i i think we should do a recap uh we got a couple of extra folks that have joined us we're kind of at nearing the end of our stream we started at seven o'clock it's Tanish, it's it's you know we've been streaming for three uh, three yeah. hours here, but and now we're going to go into our go... YouTube picks, uh, you know, through the through the I'm, night, and uh... I'm okay to do that if you all are. Uh, I just think <laughs> no, 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 I, I I think no, 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 no. I yeah. think uh, we can save that so for another two. time. Yeah, we'll do a stream where we go over our top YouTube picks, but I, I would love for us to go just recap each of us recap our top picks without the, without the you know the conversation has been fantastic and thank you both for joining today's stream. Um, I had no idea how easy it was to just talk about games like this. You know? Oh no, I um, had so much fun like not just gushing about the stuff I liked, but gushing about y'all's picks. Like you guys picked yeah. some cool stuff that I was like, Oh yeah, that is also really awesome. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's recap and then we'll, we'll say good night to everyone. Um, we'll start here with, with you Jules and then we'll go to Simon and then we'll go to mine. We'll just do a reverse order. Sure. Yeah. Uh, of course, Legends of Wind Waker, Marvel's Capcom 2, uh, Space Engineers, Fire Emblem Sacred Stones, Song Adventure 2, ba- uh, Battle or uh, DX, either way, uh, Heroes 3, Gigantic, Risk of Rain 2, and Smash Bros. Melee. The through line here, I think, has always just been um, style with like gameplay loop that just like the composition between all of these, I think, is kind of the consistency that I look for. Um, and I always look to appreciate course in any other game i look for similar qualities but i try not to be too close-minded but i think these open-ended games have kind of led me here so awesome yeah. all right let me go back to simon's picks and for my picks i have earthbound slash mother 2 subnautica chrono trigger mario paint final fantasy 6 slash 3 final fantasy 4 slash 2 
EverQuest, Silent Hill 2, and Super Mario World. And I guess my through line is like uh, both classic SNES games and also games that made me feel feelings. I was so curious if you were going to do the Final Fantasy VI slash thing because I can never keep those straight. <laughs> <laughs> I, technically when i played them it was final fantasy 2 and final fantasy 3 but yeah <laughs> i gotta be the i gotta be the elitist you know hipster and be like well it's actually six and four and then <laughs> i did play five and i liked the version where his name was where the main character's name was butts that's all i'll say awesome <laughs> and, and you there me, i had a a link, uh, The Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past, Resident Evil for the PlayStation, Castlevania Symphony of the Night for the PlayStation, Virtua Fighter 2 for the Sega Saturn, Bloodborne, Eternal Darkness on the GameCube, Metal Gear Solid on the original PlayStation, Super Metroid, and Final Fantasy 7 for the PlayStation. I'm realizing right now, as I was saying this out loud, a, a lot of PlayStation, a lot of Nintendo games that are on here with one only one variant, you know, yeah. um, being the Sega Saturn Virtual Fighter. The through line, I think, for me, are uh, is is kind of like genre defining games. Yeah, I think each of these is either genre defining or represented like a an evolutionary leap in their specific genres, um, and. And I think generational games, like games that defined the the different generations as I moved through them, and as as far as a, being a gamer who's been playing since the Tandy four hundred, I think was my original <laughs> gaming system. So, yeah, I think well, we owned an Atari Graphics at some point in my household. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Simon Fox. Thank you so much, Jules, for joining Great. tonight. And thank you, everyone, who joined in and watched along with us. Um, today, we did three by three of our favorite video games. We originally were going to do video games, our favorite <laughs> YouTube channels, and our favorite Twitch channels. Oh, but, our hubris. You know, we had a lot to talk about. So, uh, uh, Real quick, uh, yeah, Jules, uh, I met you maybe three minutes before this stream and mm -hmm. i just want to say you're so cool and i loved yeah. hearing all your stuff that's i don't know you're just super rad i'm glad i got to meet you yeah you as well simon you seem really cool i wished um yeah let's connect more like i'd love to play yes please <laughs> yeah yeah and thank you so well, much uh jail camp for for putting this whole shebang together well, let's do this more. Let's play some more games. I mean, uh, for me, and I think for a lot of us, streaming is an opportunity not only to talk about what we love, uh, but also, you know, uh, I've I've been a gamer all my life who has not been able to game for like the last ten years. <laughs> so, streaming for me is not is about hanging out with you all and playing games. So, let's play more games together. Absolutely. And also one last shout out to, to Thoth27. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for hopping on both our chats here. You are truly the best. Any nice last, you, uh, Thoth. sorry, go ahead, Jules. I was about to ask you. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. So uh, thanks for engaging with us. It seems like, um, we had a lot to relate on. So <laughs> nice to meet you as well though, through chat. Well, uh, thanks again, yeah, I'll everyone. Let you, uh, the final take us out words there. here is the final words here are that we are we are going to be streaming and raising funds for Floppy Ear Rescue out in Florida until we hit our goal of a hundred dollars. All of us are new streamers. We're, you know, I think we're we're really kind of the embodiment of just like do it because we love it. Do it because we want to play games. Do it to meet all of you and to have this amazing community. Um, but expect to see us more and more as we kind of get used to the tech, get more ideas for content. Um, and I hope you join us next time and hit that subscribe button. If you're watching this on VOD, uh, I promise my personality will get better over time. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, thank you. Your for personality us is for fine. Three by three stream. <laughs> my personality will thank only get worse. <laughs> It's hey, only going to get worse. I am going to go age like milk, direction. and he will age like wine. Um, <laughs> uh, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.